we're gonna start. She's gonna she's gonna end hers. All right, we just opened it up for attendees to start joining. We'll give it a couple of minutes, let everyone get in, and then we'll get started. So I talked to actually I got a response, Katie from Steve Oroho. He says he did not receive an invite. I'll double check my um list. Sometimes the way we send them just have a hard time making it to people's inbox. It ends up in like spam or something, but I'll make note and I'll check. Actually, can you check mine too? Because I haven't been getting the emails either. Yeah, my Morris County people have had a problem before, so that's probably what it is. But yeah, I'll, I'll make note, Betty. Thank you. Okay. Katie, we can add one of the participants as a speaker if we want to midway, right? Yes, we can. Um, we can bump them up. I gotta call one person see if they're willing to speak about active legislation. So I'll be right back. Okay. All right, we'll give it a few more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Katie, there you go. I got a question for you. I got a uh, participant, Robert Mike, is saying uh, Zoom required me to re register for the webinar. Any idea why? Re register? Yeah. No, that's a new one. <laughs> I haven't heard yeah. that before. I didn't see that one before. Yeah. I'll, I'll again, I'll make note of um, who wrote that question in. Sure. And I'll look, I'll look into it. Re register. Nope. There's another. And Tammy Leonard said she had to re-register as well. You would think like if I changed a setting, but everything is the same as when we scheduled it. So that's odd. It'll be your video. Hey, Katie, can you elevate Chuck Kucha to one of the panelists? Okay, he's sure. going to help with the legislative update at the end. Sure. All right, I'm going to stop my share. She's working on it right now, Chuck. Interesting. Good thing I gave you lots of notice. <laughs> I'm sorry, John, what was the name? Chuck, Charles Kucha. Kucha, yep. Okay, I just promoted him. All right, Chuck, you should be in. Um, oh, I did it. There you are. Okay. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> I think uh, with four people that already came forward and said they had to re-register. I think we should just wait just another minute or two in case other people are re-registering. We got about 37 people in. I know we were anticipating about, what, 10 to 15 more. So uh, maybe we'll just hold off for another minute or two in case they're re-registering. Yeah, I see those comments now, John. That is that is so strange. I'll look into it. Sorry, guys. All right. All right. How about we get started then? All right. 
Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, we have a nice turnout again, a nice end of the year roundtable. Uh, hoping everybody had a great Thanksgiving and, uh, and uh, is enjoying their holiday season so, thus far. Uh, we have a great topic today, great group of topics. We have ethics in government, uh, green purchasing, as well as tips and tricks to prepare your year-end close. We're also going to sneak in a legislative update at the end of the seminar today. So uh, we have a great group of, of presenters. I will be in the background moderating the questions. So if you have a question, please don't hesitate to type it in the Q&A box. Uh, I will get to a point where someone will be in between thoughts and I'll make sure we get your questions uh, asked and answered. And uh, you know, one of the things I always say when I present is that if I can't answer it during the presentation, just get me your information and I will get back to you with the answer on that. So you know, the whole idea is that we're here today as a round table presenting questions, answers, and learning from each other's and each other's experiences. So we've got Fred Knapp, we've got Elka Yetter, Betty Bauer, John Reinhardt, Sean Canning, who will be joining us from his car. Uh, and he'll be uh, calling it in. Uh, and we have Charlie Cuccia, who's going to be um, giving us the legislative update at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Reinhardt. Again, I'll be monitoring questions. So if you have any questions on anything at all, just please go ahead and ask. That's what we're here for today. John? Thanks, John. So good morning, everybody. So our first speaker, Fred Knapp, has agreed to speak um, on our behalf uh, for the CFO Roundtable to give us some ethics credits. For those of you that don't know Fred, uh, Fred Knapp leads Laddie Clark and Ryan's alternative dispute resolution practice uh, serving as a mediator, arbitrator, and hearing officer. Um, Fred was uh, appointed to the Morris County Prosecutor's Office by Governor Chris Christie in June of 2014, um, following the confirmation by the New Jersey Senate. He served in this position until 2020, um, but Fred was actually served as the acting Morris County Prosecutor since 2012 prior to that. Fred is, uh, well, prior to, to joining Morris County Prosecutor's Office, Fred was in private practice in Morris County, where he was the founding partner of several law firms in which he concentrated his practice in labor and employment law. I know I used Fred as a labor attorney when I was in Wharton. Fred did a great job. We worked well together, and he's, he's been a, a joy to work with. Many people might not say that, but I'll say that, but he, he was a, a pleasure to work with. Thank so with you. that, Fred, I'm going to launch that and let you get going. Thank, thank you, John, and, and thank you to everyone uh, for inviting me to, to speak this morning. A couple of, couple of uh, comments. As John said, uh, I joined this firm about two years ago, and after uh, approximately eight years as county prosecutor, uh, those of you may or may not know, there's a separate statute that governs the ethical conduct of everyone in the county prosecutor's office. As attorneys, we were also subject to the rules of professional conduct that are promulgated by the New Jersey Supreme Court, as well as the uh, local government ethics law. So we had layer upon layer upon layer of ethical considerations uh, whenever we took action. So uh, in addition, uh, as John said, uh, beginning in December of 2012, I was the acting prosecutor. I was acting for approximately 18 months before I finally had a confirmation hearing uh, before the Senate was confirmed. During that time, I was an assistant attorney general, which meant I reported directly to the state attorney general, which meant that there was yet another layer of supervision. So before we did took certain actions, we had to report in, and uh, I could say that in 99.9% .9 of the times they approved uh, what we wanted to do. It was very rare that they didn't. Uh, but they were a great sounding board whenever we needed uh, a question asked. It was like having a, uh, an advisory council, if you will, but they have more teeth. They could say, don't do that. Once you become county prosecutor, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, unless you ask for help, you're not going to get it. Uh, that's just how the, the, it works. It's just 21 counties is too much for one person to constantly supervise. So each county handles it. As a good friend of mine said, uh, every county prosecutor gets paid the same, whether you're in Salem County, which is the smallest, or whether you're in Essex County, which is the biggest. Uh, the headaches are similar. They're just magnified, uh, depending upon the uh, size of the office and the, the nature of your, your uh, county. 
I can also tell you that when I started the job, I was six feet tall. I'm now five foot eight. No, just kidding. I did actually, the physical appearance changes. I put on 50 pounds, which I've been able to lose most of it. Uh, I'm sure it's all stress related. So I'm back now uh, doing uh, what, I, what, as John described, I'm a neutral. I'm not an advocate. I had been an advocate for uh, parties in my practice uh, for uh, over 30 years. And now I'm totally neutral. So that's the work I've been doing. I'm loving it. And it's a great opportunity. So today I want to talk to you about ethics and conflicts of interest. A couple of things up front. Uh, I'm a great believer in not reinventing the wheel, which means that when John invited me to participate in this panel, I immediately started researching the local government ethics law uh, so that I could prepare a PowerPoint, because I know that's usually helpful in these programs. And I stumbled upon one uh, that was prepared by uh, Bill Kearns. And of those of you who've been active with the League of Municipalities know that Bill uh, has been counsel to the League on a state level for many, many years. Bill prepared the, the PowerPoint that I'm going to use today. I discussed it with him. Uh, he, he authorized me to do so. So I want to give him uh, credit and you'll see from the next slide. There he is scowling. He's really not a nice guy. <laughs> he scowls a lot. It's quite funny. Uh, but uh, Bill said, please go ahead. Uh, and I was very appreciative of that. So I, I give him all credit uh, and blame, if you will, for, for what you're about to, to see. Uh, it's it's uh, an overview of ethics. It is not uh, statutorily uh, uh, linked. Uh, if you want that kind of presentation, uh, that's not what I'm going to be giving you. Uh, legal citations will not be part of this presentation. But I will tell you, if you want to uh, take a look, the local government ethics law, if you haven't, you're not familiar, is Title 40A9-22.1. That's 40A9-22.1 uh, at SEC is where it starts. There are also administrative regulations um, that you can um, look at, if you will. Uh, but uh, that's as much as we're going to get in terms of citations uh, with this presentation. So there's a little humor from, from Bill. Ethics and conflicts, I think it bears a little resemblance to John Reinhardt. Okay, now ethical conduct. Ethical conduct is morally, more than merely meeting the standards required by law. It means doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And what we would say to people is uh, do the right thing even though uh, no one is watching you. Well, now I have to amend that because there's always somebody watching you. Uh, with today uh, in law enforcement, I can tell you uh, that uh, the greatest key to every prosecution, and I say that without any, any uh, limitation, every prosecution is electronics. Cell phones are an incredible resource for law enforcement, uh, as well as video. Video uh, is becoming more and more prevalent. So if you think you're alone, you're not. Uh, someone is watching you, or if you have your phone with you, uh, the phone is, is constantly, unless you're as sophisticated as some others, uh, like my, my kids, uh, that can shut off uh, tracking on these cell phones, but the histories of the cell phones are utilized by law enforcement for virtually every case we handle. So that's just a caveat to those of you, uh, I mean, you probably knew that already, but I'm just highlighting it. Violating legal standards for conduct means that ethical sanctions can be imposed, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So as I said, <laughs> we live in a fishbowl. Everyone is watching, and you can see. Oops, let's put that back. There we go. All right. So the local government ethics law establishes minimum standards of conduct requires financial disclosures and statements. And those of you in, in public, the public sector know, uh, you have to prepare your local, uh, your financial disclosure form every year. A local finance board enforces the law. Local ethics boards are allowed, but not required. And you can be sanctioned for violations. So those of you who fill out those forms know uh, how detailed they can be. 
What are the standards of conduct? No local government office or employee or member of his immediate family shall have an interest in a business organization or engage in any business transaction or professional activity, which is in substantial conflict with their proper discharge of his duties in the public interest. So for example, uh, as I said, prosecutors held to a higher standard. I had to divest myself uh, of all my interests in uh, my old law firm. People often ask me that. Well, if you're a county prosecutor, can you also stay in your law firm? No, you have to divest. I had less than 24 hours notice that I was going to be installed as the acting county prosecutor, although I had gone through the process for six months for various reasons, it, it, it didn't uh, take effect immediately. But the point was that I had immediately uh, divest myself, could not retain any financial interest in my law firm whatsoever. Uh, I also had to resign from multiple organizations, uh, some of which I was glad to do, some of which I, I wasn't. I have been an officer in my county bar association, but because they were engaged in fundraising, I thought it was the best course to, to resign that office and remain a, a, a member. And obviously that's for conflict of interest. So as I said, prosecutors held to a higher standard, but uh, same would apply here. You see, you can't have a, a conflict and we all do these annual disclosures. So let's talk about authority members. Now independent local authority member shall for one year after the termination of office of a member of that authority, one, award any contract which is not publicly bid to a former member. Two, allow a former member to represent, appear for, or negotiate on behalf of any other party before that authority. Three, employ for compensation except pursuant to open competitive examination, civil service. Every county except Somerset is civil service in terms of municipalities. Mars County is, is roughly, I would say, half. Sussex probably less. I'm not familiar with other uh, counties, but it varies from place to place. So if it's a civil service position, uh, that's, that's an, an exception. Re restrictions also apply to any business organization in which the former authority member holds an interest. So that's why you know divestment is often required to avoid these conflicts. What is the standard of conduct? No local government office or employee shall use or attempt to use his official position to secure unwanted privileges or advantages for himself or others. So no, no question, uh, we've all been stopped by law enforcement uh, in our cars. And uh, we all know that we have credentials and the standard that we would apply is take the ticket. Uh, don't use the, the words, do you know who I am? Don't show your credentials unless ask for them. Uh, if you have a badge, don't flash your badge. All of these things are bad things. We don't want to do because they could be construed as attempting to use your official position. Uh, many of you probably saw the video of a, uh, uh, I think it was a police chief in Florida who was riding recently, it was the other day, in a golf cart with her husband. Apparently, the husband was uh, driving uh, in a way that caused law enforcement to pull them over. Uh, she was a passenger. At that time, when they were stopped, they're being video recorded by the officer's uh, body worn camera. And she whipped out her credentials and said, I'm the chief of police. Guess what? She resigned. Yesterday, she resigned because of the uproar over that. Because she was attempting to use her official position to secure an unwarranted privilege. And what happened was the police officer let her go, let her and her husband leave. And that's exactly what she did. And the consequences were severe. And those of you who are film buffs all know where this is from, Casablanca. Claude Rains as Inspector Renault and, and the uh, legendary Humphrey Bogart. We're all shocked to learn that there has been political influence in the award of contracts. I'll defer to my friend, Sean Canning, who will be speaking later. I'm sure Sean is an expert on, uh, on uh, the award of, of contracts, but we all know that, that uh, things can enter into the process. We have to obviously guard against that. 
the local government officer or employee shall act in his official capacity in a matter where he or a member of his immediate family or a business organization in which he has an interest as a direct or indirect financial or personal involvement that might reasonably be expected to appear his objectivity or independence of judgment. judgment. Pretty clear? All right. So about 20 years ago, I was representing a municipality and uh, it was a civil service municipality. Uh, and in that situation, uh, the police officers take an examination for promotion. And one of the officers was seeking to be promoted to the rank of sergeant, which he had every right to do. Uh, the only thing was his brother was the mayor of that town. And uh, the mayor, as the uh, chief executive officer under the form of government in that town, uh, was the uh, appropriate authority to sign off on promotions. One of the council members says, Mayor, you have to recuse yourself. This is your brother, an immediate family member, and you cannot vote on his promotion. The mayor was very upset about it. Uh, he uh, told the members of the council that he had uh, obtained a legal opinion that he could vote on that, that he had spent $50,000 in uh, legal fees to get that opinion, and that uh, he stood by his uh, guns and he was going to vote on this appointment. <clears throat> Excuse me. He declined to uh, say, who the attorney was that had given him that opinion. He also declined to produce any written opinion uh, that supported his position. So the council asked the uh, municipal attorney to render an opinion. The municipal attorney took the uh, action of saying, it's really a labor matter. Let Fred Knapp decide this. And so uh, I was given the uh, hot potato, wrote the opinion, Mayor, you got to recuse yourself. Well, guess what happened? January 1 of the following year, Fred Knapp doesn't get reappointed. You do the right thing, whether you don't compromise your integrity. You do the right thing, and if it costs me to lose a client, you know, so be it. Uh, but I was not going to tell the, the mayor uh, that he could do something that was prohibited by law. And, you know, I took the hit on that, but I, I do the same thing again. And that's happened. That happens in your career. And it probably has happened to some of the people who are, are in the audience today. No local government office or employee shall undertake any employment or service, whether compensated or not, which might reasonably be expected to prejudice his independence of judgment in the exercise of official duties. So here's an example. A, a member of a governing body uh, happened to also be an attorney. And uh, in his capacity, he had certain restrictions on his legal practice. Uh, and he wanted to represent someone in a criminal matter. And in that criminal matter, uh, it was directly adverse to the uh, governing body that he sat on. And uh, he uh, came to me, he asked for an opinion. I said, you're prohibited, you cannot do this. There's obviously a conflict here. And he said, well, I'm going to do it for free. He's a friend of mine. I said, it doesn't matter whether you get paid or not. The conflict is, exists. You cannot, in this case, participate. So uh, when it came from my reappointment, he abstained. <laughs> Fortunately, I had enough votes to get reappointed, but he abstained and those things happen. But again, you do the right thing. Uh, you, you take the hit. If you have to take the hit, so be it. Hey, Fred, I'm just going to jump in and do a first polling question really quickly. Sure. All right, so going to launch the first poll is, have you experienced an ethical dilemma in your workplace as a CFO or someone who works in a municipality? I'll leave it open for a few seconds and then I'll share the results. And as a reminder, make sure you complete the polls as this is how we will um, give credits and track attendance. So. Do I get credit? Yeah, you actually can get credit. That's good. Okay. All right. Hey, um, Fred, one of the get, things while everybody's doing. This? Sorry, who was saying that? I'm sorry, John. That's John Reinhardt. Do we get CLE credits so that Fred can get some for this? 
Uh, don't worry about it. I've got, you I've know, got, I'll get back to you on that. I'm honestly just not. Positive. I got enough. <clears throat> All right. So it looks like most most majority said yes. A couple no's in there. Not sure. Sorry. Go ahead, John. Hey, Fred, one of the things that had come up in the question box was that, uh, and, and I, I, I wonder about New Jersey versus Florida. Um, I, I know in New Jersey, we're not allowed to use the police shields in our window anymore, are we? Like uh, courtesy cards are not allowed or? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's a really tough question. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the P state PBA and local PBAs give them out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my family would always get them and I would tell my kids, if you get stopped, don't use them. Okay. Uh, uh, it's nice to have, but it's not worth the consequence. Take the ticket. It's not worth it. someone alleging that you attempted to, to exert uh, undue influence if, if you're a political figure uh, or a public figure, rather, particularly uh, in New Jersey, where we have not just the body worn cameras, but if the, the officer doesn't have that, they have the mobile video recorder, which is audio and video. So everything you say to that police officer when he pulls you over is being recorded. And if it's not being recorded, the police officer is not doing the right thing. If he shuts off the, which they can, by the way, they can turn them off. Uh, but uh, you, you know, I, would, I would be very leery mm -hmm. of, of, of doing that. Uh, you know, the old trick was uh, to have your your uh, credentials, whatever they may be, uh, along with your driver's license and happen to, uh, you know, flash that or just, you know, incidentally show that to the officer. Uh, that's a risk. It's a risk you take. You know, just like the police officer doesn't know who's in the car he's stopping. You don't know that officer. You don't know if he's you know, somebody who's going to uh, report your action or not. I would assume the worst and you're being recorded anyway. Why take the, why take the risk? So, yep. uh, you know, those things are sold. Uh, I, uh, I've had them on, on my cars. Uh, I don't know of any uh, pro law that prohibits it, but I'd be very, very leery of, of uh, offering to show credentials unless asked for them. Right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's begin. No local government office or employee member of his immediate family or business organization in which he has an interest shall solicit or accept any gift, favor, loan, political contribution, service, promise of future employment or other thing of value based upon understanding that was given or offered for the purpose of influencing him directly or indirectly in the discharge of his official duty. So uh, I'll give you an example. I was nominated to be county prosecutor. I'm not the prosecutor, I'm just nominated, not acting. Within a week, I start getting gifts delivered to my law office. No, no joke, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And they weren't things of value, they're fruit baskets. One was a, like a bag of, or box of nuts and, and candies, and it was amazing. And I returned them. Uh, I got a few of these things and I called the attorney general's office and I said, I knew the answer, but I wanted to check in. They said, return them or donate them. Do not, do not keep them. And I thought the best course was to return them. Uh, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth that gift. It's not worth that favor, whatever, whatever it may be uh, to, to run the risk. It's the right thing not to accept it. And this individual, who I, uh, the individuals who I knew, uh, made it very clear. Oh, I wasn't looking for anything. Well, they say that. The funniest story was an ex-client called me and I was not in the office. He left a message and uh, he had been, a, he was a retired firefighter who was working for uh, another county and he left a message and it, the message was, I don't want a job. <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate you. So it was very nice of them. And we, we had a chat later on. But he made that very clear to my, my assistant who wrote the message. Um, let's continue. This provision shall not apply to announce candidate for elective public office if the local government officer has no reason to believe that the contribution was given with the intent to influence the local government officer in the discharge of his official duties. Well, that's also a fine line. You know, there's a lot of words there that can be manipulated 
that's why when someone's an announced candidate for office, uh, the best course is to resign from that, that position, uh, that public uh, position they have while they're a candidate. And that's, that's often the course. Insider training, local government version. This is a little joke here by Bill Kearns. No local government office or employee shall use or allow to be used as public office or employment or any information not generally available to the members of the public, which he receives or acquires in the course of and by reason of his office or employment for the purpose of securing financial gain for himself, any member of his immediate family or any business organization with which he is associated. Okay. I have an example. I have an example of a lot of these things. Uh, years ago, I was a deputy attorney general uh, right out of law school. I prosecuted some public corruption cases and organized crime cases. Case I was handling involved a very high level public official. Uh, the public official was being investigated because in the town in which he was the mayor, and he was also at that time the state senator, you could have dual office. Uh, coincidentally, a, um, uh, a cogeneration plant was being built by a very large utility, garbage to energy. Remember that? It was going to be the solution to all our problems. And it just so happened uh, that in his town, he had a, 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 obviously a major a voice in approving or rejecting that process. So there were, there were uh, many, many uh, allegations that he was getting a, a financial benefit. Uh, the attorney general's office conducted an investigation over a period of years, uh, received statewide notoriety. Uh, the uh, case was uh, going to be presented to uh, the state grand jury. It was a change in administration and the incoming administration killed the case. Uh, so we'll never know what happened. Uh, and, but uh, those types of things occur in the real world. And I'm sure you've seen them uh, in your own uh, jurisdictions. No lo local government office or employee or business organization in which he has an interest shall represent any person or party other than the local government in connection with any cause proceeding application or other matter pending before that, that agency and the local government in which he serves. So obviously, if you're a planning board member uh, and uh, the uh, you have to work for a, uh, a builder or developer, uh, you have to recuse yourself. You cannot participate in any of the uh, decision-making process. This provision shall not be deemed to prohibit one local government employee from representing another local government employee where the local government agency is the employer and the representation within the context official labor union or similar representational responsibilities. You know, that's kind of a hairy situation. Uh, having done a lot of, of uh, uh, work in the field of uh, unions and uh, labor representation, uh, the best course would be pass it off to somebody else, refer it out. I, I would not take that case. I would be very leery of, of any uh, allegations of, of impropriety. And you know, one case is not going to make the difference in your career in a good way. It can make a real bad difference in a bad way. Uh, so the better course of, of uh, my recommendation, obviously not giving legal advice here, is uh, take a pass. No local government officer shall be deemed in conflict with these provisions if by reason of his participation in the enactment of any ordinance, resolution, or other matter required to be voted upon which is subject to executive approval or veto. No material or monetary gain accrues to him as a member of any business, profession, occupation, or group to any greater extent than it could, any gain could be reasonably expected to accrue to any other member of such business, profession, occupation, or group. So it's something that's a general proposition, a general issue. You know, it, it's, it's not specific to that individual, and then there would not be deemed a, a conflict. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. No government official, no elected local government officer shall be prohibited from making an inquiry for information on behalf of a constituent. Very common. I would get calls from elected officials as county prosecutor oftentimes. 
uh, provided that no fee, reward, or other thing of value is promised to or given to or accepted by the officer or a member of his immediate family, whether directly or indirectly. So the call would come in uh, and they would say, I'm calling on behalf of uh, John Doe, just inquiring, I'm not representing him, he's my neighbor, he's my friend, I'm not getting paid. Under those circumstances, uh, it would not be a violation, but it's obviously something that you have to be very, very careful with. And uh, I, uh, again, you know, uh, would recommend the uh, uh, taking uh, caution. We talked a little bit about the financial disclosure requirement uh, that you fill out every year. Each source of fees and honoraria having an aggregate amount exceeding $250 for any single source for personal appearances, speeches, or writings received by the local government officer or a member of his immediate family during the preceding calendar year. So, you know, that's, that's a really low threshold. Is it really worth $250 uh, to take any type of risk? I would take a pass. I spoke countless times uh, when I was a public officer as county prosecutor. I uh, never accepted anything. Uh, we're obviously held to a higher, higher standard. We could not even accept meals. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we were prohibited from accepting a meal. And there was called the bagel rule. And the bagel rule was you could accept a bagel, but not a sandwich. <laughs> it was, you could have a cup of coffee. Uh, but there couldn't be anything on the bagel. And, and that was literally what it was called uh, for the uh, county prosecutors. And uh, they, they cautioned us. Do people violate that? I'm sure they do. Uh, but we would actually, if we were invited to attend uh, a program and there was a dinner involved, we would write, send in a check afterwards in payment for the meal. Now, obviously, that's, that is something that, that the prosecutors are held at a much higher standard. But, you know, this rule obviously is, is something that, that you need to be uh, observant and mindful of when preparing your financial disclosure forms. Each source of gifts, reimbursement, or prepaid expenses having aggregate value exceeding $400, excluding relatives received by the officer or a member of his immediate family during the preceding calendar year. So you have to report that if you're reimbursed for expenses, get a gift of some value. Give you an example. I was president of the County Prosecutors Association, it's a year long term. And while I was vice president, my colleague, the Cumberland County Prosecutor uh, was the outgoing president. At our annual college, it, the tradition was that the president of the association would give a gift to every one of the other county prosecutors, mindful that the cost had to be under the threshold of, of de minimis value. Well, coincidentally, those of you who are baseball fans heard of the fellow named Mike Trout. Mike Trout is a star baseball player for the uh, Anaheim Angels and has been most valuable player a few times. Well, Mike Trout's from Cumberland County and uh, Mike Trout, had a close friend who was in that office who uh, was able to get 21 or so signed baseballs by Mike Trout. And Mike Trout gave us all these baseballs in a nice little Lucite box. And uh, we thought they were de minimis value. Came time for the county college. Now this is probably about eight, nine years ago. Came time for the county college, the, um, the prosecutor's college, Mike Trout becomes the most valuable player in the American League. So now that baseball value goes up. Does it exceed $400? Maybe it does. Should it go on my financial disclosure form? Yes. Why take a chance? Why not disclose it? Do the right thing. The name and address of all business organizations in which the local government officer or a member of his immediate family had an interest during the preceding year. So every, everything that you, your family or you have done involved in outside organizations has to be disclosed. The address and brief description of all real property in the state in which the officer or a member of his immediate family held an interest during the preceding year. You know, your residence has to be included and any other 
uh, property that you may have an interest in or a member of your immediate family does. Penalties. An elected local government officer or employee found guilty shall be fined not less than $100, no more than $500. And as Bill put in, expect the range of penalties will be increased probably to $10,000. Same as the state ethics code. Say that ethics code applies to state officers and employees. But the, the point is that these are, these are civil penalties, not criminal. We'll talk just a little bit about criminal, uh, but these are all civil penalties. An appointed officer employee found guilty shall be fined not less than $100 or more than $500. The board shall report its fine. This is the hammer. The board shall report its findings to the office or agency having the power of removal or discipline of the appointed officer or employee and may recommend that disciplinary action be taken. So you can lose your job that, or your, off, your elected office, whatever it may be, for a violation. You know, why, why take the chance? Those things happen all the time all right this is under the criminal code official misconduct 2c 27-10 a person commits a crime as a person as a public servant directly or indirectly knowingly solicits accepts or agrees to accept any benefit whether the benefit endures to the public servant or another person to influence the performance or of an official duty or to commit a violation of official duty so we're talking about mandatory minimum five years state prison. That's that's it. No discretion. Sentencing judge five years upon a con conviction for official misconduct. Pretty heavy. So here's a little bit of a uh, uh, an example. A developer calls and thanks you for all of your cooperation in the process of obtaining the necessary approvals, whatever it may have been. Now that the application is uh, process completed, permits issued, so the matter's been resolved. Remember is that your son was a big baseball fan. That he offered you two tickets for the Yankees, Phillies, Mets, whoever team of your choice game on Saturday, noting they are great seats. Should you take the tickets? Well, the obvious answer is no. Any difference if it was a minor league game? Uh, same answer. How about a coupon for a coffee at Wawa? Well, that's probably de minimis. Uh, it's kind of a joke here by Bill. Better course, don't take anything. A contractor who works for the municipality mentions to you that he was contacted by a council member, A, who wants some work done in his house and who said, I expect you to give me a good price because you know that I have to vote on your contracts with the town. <laughs> Question, is a council member corrupt or just stupid? I've seen both. Uh, what do you do? Well, obviously this is something that has to be reported. You have no discretion. You know, it's funny, it's like the rules of professional conduct governing attorneys. As attorneys, if we, are aware of unethical conduct, a violation of the rules of professional responsibility. Attorneys are required to report that. And if you don't report that, you yourself are subject to ethical uh, uh, violations, charges of ethical violations. Very strict, very strict enforcement. Hey, Fred, I'm gonna do another polling question. I think it's a good time. Oh, sure. sure thing. All right, I'm going to launch this next poll is, do you feel that your municipality or workplace has a chain of command in which you could report a potential ethical issue to? I'll leave this open for a minute and then share the results. All right, get a few more in. Getting hungry looking at those cookies. <laughs> I picked a bad slide to stop on. <laughs> All right, mostly everyone's answered. A few more seconds. And I'll share. So looks like most people said yes, yeah, which obviously, good. yep. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. That. Okay. So here's the infamous uh, plate of cookies. Uh, stuff would appear at the prosecutor's office. I mean, I'm, I'm seriously, I, I'm sure it happens in your office as well. Uh, I visited my local municipal office 
and uh, people had just dropped food off. You know, it just it would appear. Uh, it would just appear there. Uh, and uh, sometimes anonymously. Sometimes you didn't know who dropped it off. Uh, we would donate it. We'd, we'd give it next door to Deirdre's house. The Child Advocacy Center was next door in the prosecutor's office to next to the county administration building. We would drop it off there or take it to the, to the uh, Market Street Mission and just drop it off there. We wouldn't, we would not accept anything. Uh, but on a municipal level, you know, I mean, these things, these things happen. Uh, if there's no, if there's no attempt uh, by anyone to conduct, uh, influence you, should you accept it? I wouldn't. Uh, someone's watching. Someone's always watching. For example, <laughs> Bill, Bill put in some interesting examples here. Mark uh, Severella, presiding judge, Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, was involved in sentencing juveniles to serve time for minor offenses in private jail facilities and returned for $2.8 million in kickbacks. Found guilty of racketeering, resigned from office, disbarred, sentenced to 28 years in prison. Hundreds of juvenile sentences overturned. Pretty extreme. Uh, you know, the judges in Pennsylvania are elected uh, and uh, in many, many states. Uh, we have a different situation here in New Jersey. I, I much approve or prefer the situation we have here. County prosecutors in New Jersey are one of the few states, we're one of the few states where uh, prosecutors or uh, DAs, district attorneys, are uh, appointed, not elected. When I was prosecutor, I was... Uh, active with the National District Attorneys Association. And we would have two major meetings per year, one in the summertime, one in the wintertime. And I think New Jersey was one of only four states that did not have elected uh, prosecutors. Much of the time in those private meetings, and those discussions concerned campaigning, uh, having fundraisers. And thankfully, I was very glad that that's not the case in New Jersey for a whole a whole bunch of reasons. It's something we don't have to be concerned about. I think ours is a much better system. Here's another example. A uh, judge uh, of the Michigan Supreme Court entered a guilty plea to mortgage fraud since the one year in federal prison. I don't know the particulars of this, uh, but obviously uh, mortgage fraud is a federal offense. You sign those those uh, papers, uh, and uh, you're subject to not just local prosecution, potentially federal prosecution. Local case involving the former mayor of Patterson, sentenced to five years in prison for using city employees as workers at a warehouse owned by his family. I had a case when I was in private practice. I represented employees in a municipality. The uh, the uh, director of public works, the superintendent, I should say, of that town was a very, very uh, disliked individual. Uh, he lived not in this uh, municipality, he lived in a neighboring municipality. Very heavy uh, snowstorm hit, got on his phone, called the guys in town, hey, come plow my driveway. Uh, he resigned. He was forced to resign. Did he do something wrong? Yes. Uh, you know, he, he, his excuse was, well, I couldn't get to work otherwise. You know, hire someone else or dig it out yourself. Don't use public uh, resources for your own benefit. The example here in China where their justice system is much more swift than ours, uh, a gentleman whose name I cannot pronounce, was a commissioner, former commissioner of China's uh, FDA, was convicted of taking $850,000 in bribes from companies seeking approval for medicines, convicted in May, actually that's my wedding anniversary, May 29th, not that year, and executed two months, not even two months later. Uh, Chinese justice, very swift and very, very severe. So Bill, the author, Bill uh, Kearns, his guidelines. Number one, if your worst political enemy found out what you did and raised the issue at a public meeting, 
Would you be embarrassed and explain your conduct and trying to justify your actions? If so, then don't do it in the first place. Pretty good advice. This is classic. If your mother found out what you did, would you find it embarrassing to explain to your mother why you did it? If so, then don't do it in the first place. <laughs> okay. Number three, when, you're, when you get caught, are you gonna find it difficult to explain to your family, especially with your children, why you have been taken from your home in handcuffs? You'll be caught no matter how careful or secretive you think that you've been. It's so all obviously pretty severe. Those of you seen the movie American Hustle, remember the scene where the mayor of Camden is brought out in handcuffs in front of his family? You know, pretty sad, pretty sad day. Uh, you know, those things happen. Number four, do you really think that you would have received that gift if you were not in an official position, able to influence someone for the gift giver? If you would not have received the gift except for your official position, then you probably should not accept it. Good advice. All right, we talked a little bit about the cell phones earlier on, but whatever you text, whatever you write on that phone, expect that it would be appear on the front page of the newspaper. Seriously, that, that's how that can happen. Email issues. Please don't hit reply all. The exchanged, I'm sorry, the estranged wife of a millionaire developer found slain this month in his home, fantasized an email last year about pummeling him to death. But her lawyer said Tuesday she was only venting her frustrations over her husband's excessive legal and other trouble. That's, that's a good try. That might go well with the jury or not. Uh, whatever you put in those phones is fair game. Email. President of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville resigned after an intimate email message between the president and administrator were published in the local newspaper. Happens all the time and will continue to happen. Be very careful about any type of elect me electric uh, media, social network, any type of, of uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you may use, whatever you post, whatever you share, even if you just hit a like, as a public officer and can have repercussions. It's all out there in the public domain. Legislator thinks as email message to a female lobbyist containing explicit sexual messages are private. And then the New York Post published almost 300 of very explicit messages on their website. The stuff gets out, it's fair game. An attorney representing Eli Lilly accidentally sent an email intended for another lawyer for the company to a reporter with the same last name. The email contained information on confidential settlement negotiations between Eli Lilly and the U.S. Department of uh, Justice Department on investigation into Eli Lilly's marketing of a drug. Story was published in the New York Times. Again, emails, be very, very careful, especially uh, responding to emails because there's constant phishing, people attempt, attempting to get you to respond to things. Uh, and we all have uh, you know, drills and, and uh, uh, courses on this. I know Morris County is very, very vigilant uh, on this. I, some other counties are as well, and uh, municipalities also. Mayor sends an email from his personal email account to a local reporter on an issue involving potential disciplinary action against a police officer, it's a typo. A request is submitted for the email under Oprah in the common law. Clerk and mayor argue it's not official, but only is private political communication. Wrong, said the court. Geiger versus Borough of Inglewood Cliffs, a former client of mine uh, in Burton County. I was not their attorney at that time, 2018. Uh, that's a whole uh, a hornet's nest up there. But uh, again, you know, I, I would assume it will be public, even if ultimately you're, you prevail. Don't take the risk, okay? Oops.
Do not compose, especially do not send an email when you're angry. A former law partner of mine gave me sage advice, said when you write a letter, not an email, this is back pre-email, put it in your desk for a day, think about it. And chances are you won't send it or you'll tone it down. But the immediate response to, to emails, you know, when you're angry, very risky. Check and then check again the name and address of your intended recipient, and then check it again before you send. Again, reply all, don't do it. Reply to the sender, don't reply all. Be very careful. Verify the attachment to make sure it's the appropriate and correct item before you attach it. To avoid errors, never attach something named document dash PDF, document doc, or scan with the number. Make sure your documents are named so you can easily identify the attachment. Uh, I was in a law firm where uh, one of the uh, uh, lawyers was sending uh, attachments uh, to other attorneys in the firm. Uh, somehow he accidentally sent uh, a pornographic attachment, uh, lost his job. Do not, uh, do not email inside jokes, or use derogatory nicknames or reference to others, whether officials, co-employees, citizens, or consultants. Assume that your email will be read by the very person that you are referencing or about whom you are making the joke. There are countless cases in the courts on hostile work environments. Emails are fair game. They are discoverable and that can be deadly. Avoid danger phrases. I really shouldn't put this in writing. Delete this email as soon as you've read it. Don't tell anyone else but. Don't ask, you don't wanna know. I'm not sure this is really legal, ethical or proper. The attachments for your eyes only. It's not, you're putting out there in, in, in uh, the domain of, of whoever can read it. And we have to assume they will. Tip six, after composing your email, save it as a draft and go back and reread it a half hour later. Then remember all of the other rules as you edit it before you send it. Obviously that's an extreme situation. That's where it's something you know, controversial. It's not just a you know enclosed here with please find or a simple response, but sometimes these are these are lengthy emails. I much prefer to dictate a letter and review it, but everyone now communicates by emails, so I've been dragged into the 21st century. But I much prefer the old practice. I do my best proofreading after I hit send. Isn't it the truth? Uh, I don't tweet. Be careful what you tweet. Don't think your tweets are private. Assume they will be seen by the person that you least wants to see them. And all you know about Twitter is big controversy over Twitter. I think we're coming up, Katie, to the end of my time, so I'll just gloss over this. I mean, I'll remember Wait, Anthony. Don't, don't rush. You're good. Oh, okay. I'll remember Anthony Wiena, who, by, by the way, is on radio now with Curtis uh, Sliwa. His, his show is quite interesting, but we all remember uh, uh, Congressman Wiener, who had a promising political career, uh, was going to run for mayor of New York, claimed his Twitter account was hacked, he lied, careless, stupid, failed to understand the internet, served federal jail time, uh, you know, political career dashed, and for what? He's obviously a very, very smart man. I uh, personally enjoy listening to him on the radio with Curtis Sliwa. They have a point counterpoint, uh, you know, conservative and, and liberal. It's quite entertaining, uh, but he obviously made very serious uh, mistakes in his career, which he has publicly uh, admitted. Horrific, horrific. And we have a judge out in Michigan, Judge McCree, looks very distinguished and very uh, professional. In this photograph, not so much in the next one. Whoops, smart people do dumb things. He admitted to having an affair in his chambers with the plaintiff in a case in his court and impregnating her. He was removed from office. 
subsequently reelected, but suspended for his six-year term. He was not reelected. Whoops. In case of fire, exit building before tweeting about it. Well, that's pretty good advice. Uh, Facebook. You know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I know that the, the younger folks have, have uh, left Facebook for Instagram. In my opinion, there's no difference between them. They're all both owned by Meta. So what difference is there? The same thing. Be careful. Anyone over 13 with an email address can be on Facebook. Uh, you know, there's constant phishing, messages, photographs. Uh, you know, again, as, as public officers, public officials, uh, my recommendation is if you're going to be on Facebook, be very careful. I was pretty much uh, forced to be on Facebook because of the nature of my office. We use Facebook to get information out to the public. Uh, anything I would post on Facebook would be very uh, business oriented back then. I try to keep it very simple and non controversial. And I would recommend uh, if you're going to do it, do the same. Uh, we've had disciplinary cases involving public employees. I've served as a hearing officer in cases where people posted things uh, on Facebook or, or other uh, services, and it came back to haunt them. Social media and litigation. While your case is active, don't use social media. Good advice. Don't, period. This includes everything from Facebook to Twitter, Instagram, blogging, even if you're anonymous or doing under the pseudonym. The opposing side will, will be able to find anything you post and will use it against you. Should pretend that anything you post will end up in the front page of the newspaper because it could. Finally, don't ever send confidential information over social media. Social media is never confidential. You know, there the, I've had cases where confidential member memos were put in uh, to to people in the uh, uh, defense team in a case uh, where a, a seemingly innocuous statement was made. We had a hearing coming up. Uh, this individual. Uh, posted or sent a, a memo around to the office to people who were testifying in the case. And he uh, put in his memo, the order for battle tomorrow will be the following. And he listed the names of all the witnesses. He thought it was innocuous. I use that on cross-examination pretty effectively uh, against him. Be careful what you put in writing. Be very, very careful. Electronic communications in this day of wide dissemination of thought and messages through transmissions, <coughs> which are vulnerable to interception and readable by unintended parties, armed with software, spyware, viruses, and cookies. The concept of internet privacy is a fallacy. <coughs> Excuse me, I watch no one should rely. If any of you still have uh, landlines in your homes and you use the uh, the phone, you know, the, the remote, that's a transmitter. Someone with a, uh, a baby monitor across the street may possibly be able to hear your conversation. I, 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 by a show of hands, how many have watched The Crown on, on television? Great show. A recent episode of The Crown, a spoiler, spoiler alert, there's a very intimate conversation going on. Thanks, John. Very, very intimate conversation going on between two individuals in the cast. Uh, they're using landline phones with those transmitters. A, uh, a hacker records a whole conversation. It ends up on the front page of the newspapers. You probably know what I'm talking about. In all electronic communications, email, Twitter, Facebook, social media, recall the words from the New Testament, Luke. 8, 17, for nothing is hidden that will not be revealed, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. True. Teddy Roosevelt, one thing that I want to leave my children is my good name, don't we all? Sam Houston, former governor, state of Tennessee. I thought it was Texas. I would give no thought of what the world might say of me if I could only transmit to posterity the reputation of an honest man. And I'll tell you, you can lose your reputation in a moment by doing something foolish. 
you will get caught. The first divorce directly related to the September 11th terrorist attacks have been filed in New York. This is obviously dated. It appears a guy with an office on the 103rd floor of the World Trade Center spent the morning at his girlfriend's apartment with his phone turned off. He wasn't watching TV either. When he turned his phone back on at 11 a.m., it rang immediately. It was hysterical wife. Are you okay? She said, where are you? He said, what do you mean? I'm in the office, of course. <laughs> Amusing, but tragic. Okay, questions are guaranteed in life. Answers are. So, uh, John, if, if there are questions, uh, I'm glad to uh, hear them, but I don't guarantee answers. <laughs> so, I, I haven't seen any questions. Okay. No. That's a good sign. I think they're all afraid to talk. <laughs> okay. And I thank all of you for your attention. And I thank uh, everyone on the, uh, uh, the panel here for their uh, assistance in putting this uh, program together. Thank you all. Hey, Fred, thank you very much for speaking. We appreciate I, that. My pleasure. Thank you, Fred. Any questions before before Fred leaves? I know he's got a, a an appearance coming up later this morning that he has to get yeah. to, but if we have any questions, hit him now. I'm going to launch uh, one last polling question while if anyone has any submit before Fred leaves. And this one has to go with kind of what Fred was just talking about on the digital side. So have you noticed any new types of workplace ethical dilemmas as a result of the pandemic, remote work, or anything along those lines? Leave this last one open for a minute and, and share. All right. All right, so we're pretty split there, but there you go. Thanks, everyone. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And Thanks, enjoy Fred. the rest of the program. Thanks, Fred. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Steve Orho said to say hi, and he was uh, sorry he missed your presentation. Tell him I'll take him out to lunch, <laughs> but we'll have to split the bill. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> everyone. Not to admit <laughs> so Katie, Sean Canning is on the phone. Do you have his number? You can promote him? Yep, I will go ahead and unmute Sean. All right. So the next one is uh, green purchasing. We figured we'd get a little green credits in here for what we're doing. Um, Sean put together a, a nice little program. I can figure out what I do with his slides on green purchasing, but he uh, unfortunately was supposed to be here to present himself on video, but he is driving his daughter's car across a couple states. So I allowed Sean to talk. He just has to go ahead and unmute and then. Sean, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Tammy Leonard's hand is up. Did you want your hand up, Tammy? Oh, she did not, okay. <laughs> We're having technical difficulties with Sean. We'll move on to the, the last one, move that up, and then move back to Sean when he's able to join us. So let me try and call him. Do you guys want a five minute break? Hey, so John, can... I'm here. Oh, oh there hey. he is. <laughs> Sorry about that. You ready? I'm ready, man. All right, let's put it up. And you can hear me okay? <laughs> I can hear you great. Outstanding. I, I told you, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the car play to work, so uh, it's not. So what Sean told me before is if he hits a bump in the road, it actually knocks out his connection. So he'll be having to reconnect every time he hits a bump. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here, hopefully I'm good. So, Sean, I'm going to lead off then. So, I, I think most of you know who Sean is. Sean is um, former police chief, Lincoln Park, became administrator of Lincoln Park, then moved to Mount Olive as the administrator for four years, Sean? Yeah, just under four. Just under four. Then he retired because he's a quitter. 
um, but has been keeping the Canny, <laughs> keeping the Canny Group running. Um, and I've been involved with Sean and the Canny Group since the inception. Um, but Sean has found that he has an affinity for purchasing and loves doing it. Sean, how many clients do you have for purchasing? 20-something now? Uh, I'm, I'm just under 30. I'm at 29 now. Twenty. He's QPA in 29 entities. So I think Sean has... Uh, has established himself as a purchasing expert. So we decided to add some green purchasing today to the the agenda just to see if we can, you know, give it a new little flair. So Sean, the uh, <coughs> you, your slide start off is what is a green product? And the legislation defines that is, let me advance my slide. Can everybody see those slides? Can't hear you, so I'm gonna assume you can. Yeah, we see them. Uh, but means any commodity or service that has a <coughs> A lesser or reduced negative effect on human health and the environment when compared with competing commodities or services. And in prepping for this, Sean and I talked about, so, you know, what, what can we talk about? And we talked about the electric vehicles, charging stations, because we're all now tasked with having to do this. Um, so, Sean, you interrupt us as you want, and we'll run this because this is not how we intended to run this part of the program. Yeah, and I could jump in and just to give, uh, first off, thanks for, thank you for uh, inviting me. I, I don't know whether it was a uh, invite or a curse when he mentioned um, speaking on green purchasing, because it's it's really, is dry. <laughs> it's, so so when we were talking about this, you know, the traditional green purchasing that we had gone through, that, you know, stuff that Rutgers had put out and stuff when I was uh, teaching the uh, public purchasing things, it, it's it's tough. It's a tough, um, tough topic because it, it does, it just gets very dry. So it was kind of, you know, when, when John and I were racking our brains together here a little bit, like, you know, how do we make this very interesting and, and also, you know, make it relevant to everybody? So um, in, in that regard, yeah, there's, there's such a big push across the country now. And, and you know, it touches upon a couple of things. Um, I'm going to segue off into economics here a little bit. And, and John and I were just kind of talking yesterday philosophically about the whole, you know, any change in the economy. And, and we'd spoken about SREX years ago, if you remember them, back with the solar um, thing. And that, and that was government set. So I always get a little leery when I see government-driven economics, even though that, that, that's certainly the reality in our, in our economic system to, to, to a large extent. Because once those controls are gone, you know, I was worried about, okay, what's the free market going to do? So, you know, touching upon the SREX, you know, if you remember way back when in 2009, the, the SREX were set at $535 of credit, and there was a, a floor that was put on there by the, by the state of New Jersey, and it, and, and it was, had an expiration uh, time on it, which I believe was about – 2013 or 2014, and when that went away, what happened? The, the SREX, you know, market just dropped. So, similarly, I, I, I tend to think the, the electric vehicle and that push, uh, which is being being pushed, you know, by, by by certainly state and national level, I think it's here to stay. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how economics keeps up with that. So, before we get into that, you know, the notion of green vehicles and it's being embraced, and and, and we're getting money to do it. So, you know, how do we procure it? How do we kind of stay green and, and, and try to move that forward. But on the other hand, you know, the, the, the topics pop in my head is, you know, will the power grid keep up with that? You know, I, I couldn't help but note this past summer in California, um, you know, during, during their heat wave, and, and there were about 3% uh, electric vehicles in California. There, there, was, uh, there was warnings in the afternoon, you know, try not to turn your air conditioning on and don't charge your electric, electric vehicles in the, uh, in the afternoon. So that kind of, you know, tells me that the utilities, the grid, and, and maybe the private sector – isn't caught up yet with, you know, the state and national policy because you know, that's three percent. What happens if we get up to 20, 25, 30 percent? So those those are some some hurdles that are gonna have to be faced um, going down the road. But, but back to John's point. So the, the the green policy by the legislature defines a green product as that. And, and yeah, as purchasing agents, if all things being equal, you get it if you can. The problem is again the, the market demand, and, and I'm going to use the example of electric vehicles, they're, they're expensive. Um, they're, they're far more expensive than, than you know, the, the traditional, um, you know, um, gasoline or, or diesel vehicles. So kind of flies in the face of the other part of, of, of my passion, which is just proves I have no life, the uh, local public contract law, that, that the lowest responsible bidder. So how does that, you know, how, how do we make the lowest responsible bidder when it comes to green? So, um, you know, we, we're going to touch upon that in the coming slides. So uh, go ahead, John. I just want to kind of give some thoughts there about what you and I have spoken about in the past on this topic. So what's interesting though, is we, we talk about electric vehicles and, you know, everybody's talking about the traditional five, three to five year life of a, a normal vehicle. When 
a, an electric vehicle, the first time you have to actually service your batteries is after 350,000 miles. So when we start to talk about longevity of the vehicle versus the cost of the vehicle, there's also no oil change, there's no lubrication. The only thing you do is you change tires, windshield wipers, and windshield wiper fluid. Those are the only things you service on an electric vehicle. So now you get back to, okay, is this now a three-year vehicle or is this now a 10 to 15-year vehicle? We know cops beat up the cars, but we now have a new <laughs> dynamic to measure this by, which is the vehicles don't die because the engine's shot because they beat them up. It's not electric. It's really, it all comes down to battery health. So if you treat the vehicle right, this vehicle should last three times the life of a normal vehicle. Right? There's, there's no... You know, John, that, you know, that's a good point, John. And, and calculate lowest responsible um, bidder. You know, you, you can life cycle cost through that. You know, you, you start doing the, the labor costs of your, you know, your average salary of your public works plus materials. You know, do, do that over the, the, the similar course of an electric vehicle versus a... Um, you know, traditional gasoline vehicle, and yeah, you can you can argue and, and, and document on a Google sheet, whatever, that those costs are going to exceed the, the electric vehicle. That's a good point. So an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine versus a electric vehicle, when you start to look at the cost comparisons, the, the life cycle is three times that of a normal vehicle. It just comes down to wear and tear. So you're not using your brakes because the brakes on an electric vehicle are the regenerative braking. It brakes for you. So you're not replacing brakes which means that there's that service goes away, the lubrication goes away, the oil change goes away. There's no gas consumption. It's just, you know, the, the issue is, is if you buy these, do you have the ability to charge them? And I've run into a couple entities that went crazy buying electric vehicles and didn't think about how to fuel them. So they're plugging in with a 110 line instead of a, you know, a, a level two charger that can charge them faster than that or a level three or a direct charge. And I know showing that's later in the, in the presentation, but you know, there's there's a lot of other factors to consider here. That you know, if you get rid of all those maintenance costs and you're just looking at tires, windshield wipers, and windshield wiper fluid, that's a lot of savings. Sean, you go quiet. Yeah, agreed. It's I'm not. I'm I'm still here. Not, I, I agree. Like I said, and 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 the stuff that we have in the presentation today, I kind of delved into some co-ops to really make it you know, easier uh, to make it user friendly for the audience here. But you're right, you know, listen, if you got a good, if you got a good QPA, many of you are QPAs. Uh, so if, if you want to do those type of specifications and don't like what's out there on, on we're going to touch upon the national co-op level or, or in, you could write your own bid and, and you can certainly justify lowest responsible bidder uh, when it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, and, and again, you know, in that area, oh, one point I wanted to touch upon before, you know, if you go to the local public contract law, the only time it mentions green is is, is certain areas under under, uh, under solar and, and, and building with engineers and and also with what we're here for today is is the um, you know your QPA renewals where we have to have the the hour of, of CUs on green but other than that it's not explicit in the local public contract law so it, it it does make it a little bit difficult for the average QPA out there you know when, when you're purchasing to get away from the old mindset and then try to incorporate the new green stuff. It's new. So I just got a text from Charlie Daniels, who's also on the on the seminar today. He's got an electric vehicle. He says 100,000 miles on his car. So far, it's $120 in maintenance over 100,000 miles and just tire rotations. So 100,000 miles and just $120. That's, I mean, so you've got to look at, so when you're looking at the lowest responsible, what are you looking at? So the lifespan yep. of these new things are crazy. And, and, you know, I think many of you know, I bought a Tesla last year, not knowing it was going to change my job. So I go to, to Hackensack every day. It's 42 miles each way. It costs me I think $1.50 a day to commute to Hackensack or $130 a month to do 2,000 miles. My, my commute today, John, is going to cost uh, two tank bulls that's over $100. There you go. That's my whole month. Yeah, it's my six hours. So, so you can move we're, on to the next slide if you want. Moving on. There you go. So the next slide, Sean, is some. some I'm assuming you can't read, or can you read? 
No, no, I'm on the turnpike right now. That would be really bad if I was reading. <laughs> so the next slide talks about green purchasing in action. Instead of rehashing green approaches in general, we are going to focus on available large green projects out there right now. And it talks about EVs, which is what we just talked about. And, and also the charging station, because if you've got an EV, you got to be able to fuel it. You know, I could, I could touch upon that. We could probably advance to the next slide, too, if you want, while I'm at that. Sure. So, so several years ago, before this really became a big push, um, one of my clients, we, we were down in uh, Hopewell. This is going back to about 2016, 17. And it was one of the first times, you know, I was working with the engineer, and, and we were putting out a bid for, um, you know, electric charging stations. And there were no co-ops that were doing this at that time. It was really just kind of uh, the engineer had to do a lot of research. And so he came up with a tech spec that worked with him over over two months, and then he gave it to me. I, put, I slept on the front end and then tried to find vendors out there that, that, that would be able to accomplish, you know, electric uh, charging stations on municipal property. And, and the whole process, we ended up only getting, seriously, maybe two or three electricians that were able to handle it. And it, just to tell you how fast things change, like I said, I, I believe that was 15 or 16. And, and the bid went on, we awarded it, and the project, you know, took, took a really long time. And, and say about eight months later, it was it was all set to go, and it was really quite a novelty at the time. Now, you fast forward to now, and, and, and we're going to touch upon it. It's not on this slide in, in the coming ones. You know, there, there's, some, there's some resources out there uh, for you all, and that's what I really wanted to kind of get across today as we get into it. There, there's some state cooperatives out there, and in particular, we'll get on to ESC and J. And, and the other ones that are out there, um, and it touches upon our, our, our local finance notice and purchasing, is the Source Wealth National Co-op. If you're not a member of that, uh, I, I, would, I think everybody is, but if you're not, Highly, highly recommend getting into um, that national co-op. And, and when we get there, we'll touch upon um, LFN 2012-10. Uh, it's a little bit different than the state co-ops. Cool. So, hey, Sean, I was looking at my notes from the beginning, and I think we, we skipped past this. So where does the requirement for green purchasing originate? You know, i got to tell you, <laughs> it, 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 it came out from that state law but they didn't incorporate it to the local public contract law. So that, that's where it's kind of bifurcated. So, so we're, we're kind of commanded to move to green. And again, that's, that's the conflict I see. And I, I think with vehicles, we can make that justification where, where you, it, it touches upon lowest responsible bidder. Um, the avenue really for us to make it easy on, on the end user is the co-ops because they've done that work. Otherwise, it's very difficult to write specification aiming, aiming at, at purchasing green and then still getting the lowest responsible bidder. I, I think we just made the argument with a vehicle, we could do it. Certainly with supplies you know if you buy concentrate compared to um you know uh wholesale and having to, to mix and labor hours that sort of thing uh it comes out cheaper per gallon but a lot of things it's really it's really difficult to, to abide by that state push for green and still you know adhere to the uh, to the lpcl right so i think it was somebody's agenda at the time that there's nothing specific that points to why we have green purchasing credits no no you're right it's uh, i know me and you speculated uh but uh yeah you know, now we've got a, a federal or national goal of becoming completely electric within, what, 20 years. New Jersey's got a more aggressive goal of becoming fully carbon neutral by 2030-something. Um, so I think that's what's pushing <coughs> the agenda and, and where we are with these electric vehicles. But I think we need to deal with it. Plus, there's been some legislative action where they require, if you've got new development, that you have to provide so many chargers per units that you're creating a new, not just affordable housing now, but now you've got charging responsibilities on these sites. That's interesting, you know, and the other thing probably uh, probably jumps, it, it certainly jumped in my head, and I'm, I'm sure many of our, many of the people um, watching or listening today, it, it, you know, what do you do with the larger vehicles? You know, again, a, a smaller electric vehicle, yeah, okay, the, the, the market seems to be providing that. Um, but it was interesting because uh, over in Englewood, they, they helped them out as well. Um, we're in the process of purchasing two huge electric sanitation trucks. Now, the, the, the cost is far more than a, than a, than a, a traditional you know, diesel-powered sanitation vehicle, but, but there's, the, the market's starting to, to meet that demand, and uh, we got them off the, uh, the source well co-op. Uh, so, it's, yeah, two, two, two big old you know, electric garbage trucks. That's, that's kind of crazy. So that, that was one of the things that jumped out at me, like how, how are you going to keep the, you know, the, the changeover on the big rigs, especially uh, some of the, the, the states are having very aggressive legislation, you know, no – no, uh, as you said, no ICE vehicles um, sold in the states by 2000 and uh, or, or, or um, uh, uh, by the year 35. So, you know, you're talking 13 years from now. You know, that's going to come awful quick. 
and how do you, how do you transition that fast? But in some sectors, it is going a little bit quicker than um, I would have anticipated. Well, you know, the, the cost of the vehicles is three times, but if you're getting three to four times more longevity out of them, is it there's a cost benefit. Plus, with the grants that are offered there to subset or you, to subsidize one third of that cost, you're now at two times. But the vehicle's lasting three times. I mean, the, the sticker shock is, oh my gosh, it costs so much more. But does it? You know, John, you, you touched upon grants there, and and you're right with with the um, with, with the federal funds that have been coming down, and in in the coming slides, there, there's some private stuff out there. there there's uh, certainly under New Jersey Clean Energy, and I think I have a link in the coming slides. And forgive me for bouncing around again. I, I I'm not staying on PowerPoint. I don't know where I'm at, but. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, you, you'll see the New Jersey Clean Energy has, has all sorts of incentives out there. There's a Volkswagen one. So, so we'll talk about that when we get into it. But uh, there's a lot of incentives out there. So for us on, on the user end, um, you know, the answer, answer becomes, yeah, why not? If, 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 if it's offset for a budget, if it's a long-term savings and, and the money's there, well, again, we're going to have to go that way anyway. Well, it's you know, the, uh, the old uh, adage of, of OPM, other people's money, uh, certainly helps with our budget. So I'm getting a text from Danelle Bright in Vernon saying, how the heck do I manage a Tesla or an electric vehicle fleet in Vernon, which is the northwest side of the state, which is very diverse. It's mountainous. It's I mean, they've got a huge amount of area to cover. So how do we do this in, a, in an area like that? Grants. You get, the, you get the EV charging stations there, and while you're at it, you know what? Maybe if there's enough money. Again, I, I work for Dell. She's my CFO. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'll maybe have a conversation Monday. But, uh, yeah, there's funding availability. And, and Vernon is, well, they're not unique in New Jersey. They're, they're certainly mountainous, but a lot of Sussex County, upper city county towns are like that. You know, you may want to consider a substation charging if they have to, like you said, with the, um, with the direct charges, if, if that's able to be put in. Um, so it, it's a fleet management issue. It's, it's a, it's a grants you know, uh, a grant funding issue. And if, if it's possible to put that in some sort of plan, then at, then at the very least, she's at 21 Church Street in uh, Vernon. So if, if you can put a facility there and if you need it, depending on, on how, how large and how far the charge goes, you know, you consider a substation if, if the funding is available. And not local funding, Danelle. Don't, don't, don't go crazy. Right. So, the, the, you know, Sean, you and I had a debate yesterday and talking about this is that when they, they start a new initiative from the government, <laughs> Obviously, the government has to subsidize the startup because nobody's buying in, right? Because, uh, you know, we talk about electric vehicles, that they're subsidizing all these stations. The S-REX was a government subsidy to try to move people off of traditional generation from coal and, and whatever generates electricity to now where we are. <laughs> but now we've got this new electric vehicle. So if you've got a, a town like Vernon, which is large land size, you've got to create multiple charging stations across the county if you're going to move your fleet to electric versus internal combustion. Hey, John, I, I want to... Again, yeah. and, and they're not... Sorry. I was just... Uh, thought you had a pause there. We have a question that came up here about the disposal of the batteries in 15, 20 years. Is there... Uh, how is that going to going to work and has that been projected by anyone prior to us just jumping in and buying the vehicles so i'm uh, i will be retired by the time that decision has to be made and i don't <laughs> have to deal with that sean is already retired he's just still functioning um you know i, I there's been a lot of jokes about sending the kids over there back into the mines to put it back in the mines but i i, I don't think that's something that to, uh, i know i won't have to deal with it well, I just think that the, that the question comes from two points, if you look at it, right? Is there going to be a cost involved with disposal of those batteries and those cars? And then what is the environmental impact? I mean, everybody, it's great that everybody's green now, but what do these batteries do environmentally in the next 15 to 20 years when you dispose them and how do you dispose them? Are we going to have uh, sites that are going to be ultimately super fun sites in 40 years because we put them in the ground and you know, I just don't know. I mean, you with with green purchasing and all, has there been anything presented to you that uh, that you know of that that what's the plan for these things? So I think like everything else that becomes recyclable, they're going to figure out how to take like the traditional battery right now in your car has a ton of lead. Right. But they, they recycle those batteries, they recycle the lead, they do what they're going to do and they they repurpose them. So. 
my guess is that at some point in the future, they're going to figure out how to repurpose all these lithium ion batteries or whatever they use in the batteries. And they're going to figure out how to repurpose it. But it's you know, people's... it's a great point, though, John. Um, yeah, it, it's a terrific point because, again, it's an unforeseen consequence. And, and that's why, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of a policy wonk, but I hate policy because a lot of times policy is driven by emotion and subjective thoughts rather than that, that's, that's a really valid question. Yeah, or, you know, can we punt it to the next generation? Yeah, and that's probably what will happen. But it, it's, you know, it's right. And then, then they have to deal with a super fun cleanup. Or, listen, that, this goes back to our capitalistic market system and maybe somebody in this room here uh, – there's going to be some companies and a lot of money being made on, on how to repurpose and take this off end users' hands and, and, and turn it over somehow. So, yeah, so I, I don't know if that answer's out there. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to research it, but it's, it's really a valid point. I agree with you, John. I think somebody will figure it out, but that's that's not sound policy. <laughs> it's just kind of like, yeah, we'll figure it out. But No, I mean, we're, we're being dictated from the federal and state level as to what the goals are, and we're just dealing with it. So, I mean, here we are with these electric vehicles and, and what they do, but you know, understand that they live three to four times the normal life cycle of a, a regular vehicle is just something we're gonna have to deal with is that they're gonna be on the road longer. So our financing goals become it's... much different than they were. Hey, here's a thought. I'm um, here to put on your, uh, uh, okay. Can we capitalize cars now? Because if they have a life expectancy beyond five years, I think that's uh, – they've already – didn't they – they made a change in the, the legislation already to make accommodations for electric vehicles. So I think they do acknowledge that. Okay. That just popped in my head. Sorry, I'm just going to step on. Hey, John, I think um good time to do a polling question on this. I'll jump in. You should just ask Sean what he thinks. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Sean from his car, I don't think uh, – yeah. All right, so the first polling question on this topic is, has your municipality had any experience yet with green purchasing of goods or services that benefit the environment or improve efficiency, such as reducing waste, saving energy, money, water? And I'll give it a minute to let everyone get your responses in. So while they're pondering this, when I got to Bergen County, I know the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's department bought many electric vehicles. I said, that's great, so how are you gonna charge them? They said, what are you talking about? As they're running cables, from the AC chargers, the 110, out to the cars to charge these cars at five miles per hour. And we've now fixed that. We've now created many level two, and we're working towards level three chargers for the more aggressive responses so that they can actually take these vehicles, plug them in. We're also, we've got, um, we're putting a total of 10 chargers in our main parking deck, which can charge 20 vehicles at a time. And we're watching the the employee fleet is starting to grow as to who's driving electric vehicles and we're we're not just teslas we're tesla we're um chevy's got the the volt i think volt or bolt whatever that one is that's another popular one we've seen a ton of Volkswagens are coming in but everybody's starting to now charge and it's becoming competitive to get to these charging stations because right now we have one station that charges two vehicles but we're going to expand it to five, which charges 10 vehicles. But now we've got two lots, so we'll have 20 vehicle charging capacity at any one time, not including our public works, our prosecutors, and our sheriff's department, which also have their own charging stations. So it's starting to expand. But the grant funds are generally limited to those that open the charging opportunities to the public. Let me do one question. John, who's this question from? That's from John, but I like driving a new car every five years. <laughs> Must be nice to be a partner. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right, are we beyond? I'm still here. All right, so we're gonna move on. So Sean, point out the uh, the slide that talks about Bloomberg predicts the global passenger EV sales will increase from 3.1 million in 2020 to 14 million in 2025. That's a 325% increase. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 the, the trends are certainly going. Like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating if, if you like, you know, watching change in society. So, uh, again, yeah, that, that, that it's government and, 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 you know, federal and state level driving these, these policies. And, uh, but, and, and the difference between this and, and I, I don't want to, 
repeat myself too much, but the difference, I think, between this and the SREC is I, I do believe this is kind of here to stay. Uh, so, so government is taking the lead on this. But, you know, if you can even notice that the, the – uh, some of the the, the uh, manufacturers of vehicles are saying they're not going to make certain uh, models after after the coming year, I believe, uh, which kind of breaks my heart. Uh, but so you're going to see the the, uh, the private sector catching up catching up with public policy, and, and I do think this is uh, this is here to say in one form or another. Do I do I think you're going to go 100 percent in the time frame? No, no. But you're certainly going to see a, a significant percentage, if not a majority, of the vehicles being that way. But, but again, you know, there's a lot of unforeseen uh, factors. There, there was that question before about the uh, battery disposal, but also the, the grid. I mean, the, the, the electric grid in this country, is, you know, from things I see and, and read is, is not where it's supposed to be. I think we're very fortunate here in New Jersey. We, we have, a, we have a, a fairly good grid, and we, we don't have the, the brownout that they have out west. Uh, but again, what, what, at what point does, you know, that reach, you know, critical mass and you start getting brownouts or reductions in service, and that's concerning. Absolutely, you know, and another push is there. So it's the push for us to go there first to drive the demand for the grid, or does the grid grow before us, which then goes before BPU? And there's the rate setting and how to afford that. So there's there's you know the chicken and the egg. Who comes first? Well, it is an ironic, you know, uh, the economy here as well because a lot, you know, a lot of your you know, I told my kids, you know, when they when they come out of college, you know, you, you wonder what happened. But you, you mentioned, like, okay, I'm going to go green, all electric. I'm like, you know, well, where do you think you get the electric from? You know, right now, the, re, the renewable, you know, windmills and solar, they're, they're certainly helpful, but they, they can't carry the majority of the load. The majority of the load currently is, is coal. So that's kind of a revelation to, you know, my 22-year-old. My but uh, the, so if, if you have to upgrade the grids, I mean, we have to burn more fat, fossil fuel and then, you know that goes back to policy again. You know, do, do we do we upgrade the grid to keep up with the electric demand? It's uh, you know it's interesting to watch the the policy go back and forth on this. Very. So what's funny is I when I got an electric vehicle, I decided you know what, let me go solar. I can become carbon neutral. I'll do my whole solar. But because Sean, we talked about the SREX at the beginning, SREX have died. So there's, the government subsidy is gone for that market. So I wasn't saving much money to put a whole mess of solar panels on my roof to drive my car. But it's, it's I, that, and that would be that would be a, that would be a great system too, wouldn't it? That'd be awesome. It would be. All right. So next one is green purchasing. What money is out there? ARPA funds and other funds and the Volkswagen settlement. You want to weigh in first, Sean? You know the Volk. Um, okay, you can jump in, John. I'll, I'll follow up. So I know a lot of us jumped on the, the Volkswagen settlement. I know Wharton was able to get a grant for a new garbage truck that was all electric. Um, but the, the fund paid for a third, again, of that garbage truck, which now became three times the cost of a normal truck. And what's interesting is they deliver a truck with an engine. They then rip the engine out. They then replace it with an electric engine. So it seems like there's got to be some net cost of uh, moving that engine out to repurpose it in order to sell it to then come out with your net electric vehicle. But again, that thing is no oil changes, no lubrication, none of the normal stuff that's going on. Hydraulics, I'm sure, are still there. But what does it cost to operate this vehicle? So if they're subsidizing one third, you're now getting two thirds, but the vehicle's good for a three to five time cycle. It's something that's new to us that we need to figure out and quantify. Yeah, and, and there was a Volkswagen settlement, and, and we'll see in the coming slides. There's other funding sources out there. You know, federal um, uh, funding, the, the ARPA and the CARES Act and all that. I, you know what? I know it's been the last couple of years and coming out of COVID, and, and they were trying to, to, to you know push things along. I'm not so sure, even with the change in the House and keep, keep an eye on the federal level, uh, I'm not so sure that you won't see another one in some form or another because because it's it's not like it's it's complete gridlock in in Washington. There will be some to some extent, and I, I don't want to venture into the political here, but it, it does impact on on what monies we get from the federal level. So it wouldn't surprise me if you saw a reduced package and some sort of grants coming down the line again within the next few years, uh, particularly once it gets into the silly season again, where where there's you know they start ramping up on the um, political issues in 2024. So if that's the case. You know, you keep an eye for, for the federal level if there is something there, and, and perhaps we're ready. You know, we have a plan, uh, and, and I'll use Vernon as the example. Vanell, I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking uh, next week. You know, maybe we already have a cost-out plan where where you have substations and an electric vehicle 
charging stations, and when, when money becomes available, uh, you very quickly are able to, to implement that plan. Cool. So Danella has stopped texting me because I think she's afraid I'm going to keep quoting her. So, Sean, the next slide talks about oh, all the extra gonna. funding. What's that? I said I'm going to. So we, the next slide from you was on talking about the different funding sources, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, and the additional 2.5 billion for EV charging stations in rural and disadvantaged communities. Yes, yeah, so, so these are on, I don't know if I have the clickable links or not, and, and I kind of put it up there for the, for the, uh, for the folks today. If, if, you, if you want a chance to kind of just tr run them down from, from your internet, you know, there's still, you know, some of them, the deadlines have passed, uh, I would expect renewal. There's other ones that are still viable out there. And, uh, you know, if, if you, I know we're all strapped for, for personnel time and grants writing and funding, but they're certainly worth running down. Um, so so it's, it's worth looking into. I, I just in my own research, I've seen that these were out there. Uh, and I kind of put it as a resource for the um, CFOs and the other, the other uh, uh, people in the forum today. Uh, and, it's, you know, you never know. Listen, it's, for all the grants out there, we all like to think that we all apply for them. But the reality is, you know, our staffs are reduced. We have a tough time, you know, finding time applying for grants. And then you never know. It's, uh, they give the money to somebody. So, you know, why not us? Right. So, Sean, the next slide talks about the state of New Jersey, that they've now created incentives for creating these charging stations, um, electric vehicles. But there's also a uh, land use law change that requires that if you have residential properties that you're now required to provide a certain number of chargers per residence on a property to, to allow them to charge. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think that's smart policy. Uh, again, we're talking about just having policy in unforeseen um, circumstances and, 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 and consequences. But, but in that regard, I think that's smart because you know, if we're going to go this way, then we have to build out the infrastructure. And, and notwithstanding, you know, do we have the power to to light them up, and, and certainly we do currently. But the uh, but future development, yeah, I mean, it's 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 going to be tough for an already developed community to, to, to have that, you know, other than if we're going to have large redevelopment. But other areas where there's building going on like crazy and, and it's new building, it's, it's, it's very smart development. True. So the next one, we start talking about the electric vehicle tourism program. Talks about making it available to boardwalks, parks, overnight lodging, um, and then having the fast charger at once. But the you know the the grant subsidies don't necessarily cover the, those costs. You know, Sean talked about in the beginning the yep. ES, ESCNJ, which is the the largest co-op in the state. Sean, ESCNJ is, is really one of my go-to's. You know, there's a lot of co-ops, and I'm sure everybody you know knows most of them. You know, by by heart, there's the the, the, the um, the Bergen County one, it's, it's under the uh, what, uh, N NJCA or whatever it is. Um, but ESCNJ really ha is, has become a go-to on a lot of things. And, and if anybody's had time to, to try to track stuff down at NJ Start, it's, uh, it, it's difficult at best. ESCNJ makes it really easy and searchable. Uh, and I've used them uh, a lot of times. The most recent, um, uh, Newton just uh, just used their uh, their EV installation co-op. And, and, you know, I, I like that. And I, the reason I gave that reference about writing bids in the past is you know it, it it was difficult at the time especially if you're writing it uh you know the initial bid you know now that some of them are out there i'm sure we can all kind of you know copy and paste from from other towns but you still got to get your engineers involved there's a lot of there's a lot of site work uh and, and that sort of ramp up whereas the co-ops you know i love co-ops because the in-state one you, you get the quote you follow the uh you follow the administrative code and the lpcl we get a resolution on and boom it's in uh that that, that one uh, and I'm sure that there might be others around the state. I, I, I didn't get a chance to delve into them before the seminar, but that, that one is good until I think um, uh, September or October of next year. And then they might extend or they'll, they'll, they'll redo the bid. Uh, but, but that's just, it's a turnkey solution, uh, which I like. And, and that's, that's, again, it's EV charging stations, uh, a simple reso, quote, under the, um, under the co-op, and you're done. And, and that makes it easy. Right. And, and Bergen County is the second largest co-op in the state of which I have the pleasure of running. Uh, as the, the QPA or purchasing agent for Bergen County, but we also have an electric vehicle charging bit out there that allows us to access, I think it's Juicebox, who we're using for all of our locations, and it has an installation. It's Everything is variable, so it's your installation plus the cost of the, the units to get them in. 
Yeah, but and, and you know what? I, 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 you know, consider, consider you're my buddy. You think I would have looked at the Bergen County call-off. But, <laughs> it, 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 but again, you know what? Th- th- those one-stop you know, one stop shopping, and, and then you can kind of you know, trade them off against each other. You get quotes under the Bergen County. You get quotes under the ESCNJ, and, and you go with a better deal. I mean, it's, it's, and it makes it easy. It, it's not like it was six years ago. It makes it very easy now. If you have the funding and you have the location, you have the plan, uh, then it makes it very easy to, to just implement that. And not have to worry about going through the bid. Listen, the bidding process, I, 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 my God, I must do, seriously, 11 bids a week. And, and, and most of them go well, but, you know, a lot of them don't. You get fatal flaws. There's delays. There's, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with the bidding process. I, I like the bidding process, but, you know, it, it's more of a an, an, an more detailed uh, project. It's more of a crapshoot, whereas if you have the co-op, yeah, why not? If, if the price is going to be comparable or savings, go with it. True. Cool. All right, so we're ready for the next slide, Sean. It talks about the community yeah, sure. uh, that the, it, it pays to plug level two charging stations offers four thousand dollars per purchase, JCPNL, PSCNG. You know, we've got all these programs out there, but it's how do you access them? You know what? If if if, if uh, the, the people in the audience, if you get a chance, and I found it really easy. I googled uh, New Jersey Clean Energy um, Electric. Uh, I think electric vehicle program or something along those lines, but it was, it was a clean energy program. And there was also, there's one page that pops up, uh, which I've referenced on the slide there. And there was all sorts of resources. I was actually pretty surprised that it was, you know, a lot of times you, you, you try to search something, especially at the, at the state level and it becomes very difficult. This was actually replete with a lot of resources. They're, they're all either, um, you know, they just expired and they will be renewed or they're, they're current. I know there's some that are expiring, I think June or July of next year, there's plenty of time to get applications in, uh, and it's all, it's all you know, it, it's, it's New Jersey-based, so we're not competing nationally with these. It's, it's a nice opportunity, so it, it, at least it's a resource, and I'm sure everybody here, we have to deal with elected officials and, and, and elected you know, mayors and, and whatnot, and, and they all like the, the uh, you know, to push this agenda as well because it's good publicity. It's good policy. It's, it's, you know, the public certainly has a certain desire to go there, so there's, there's kind of a, a nice resource for us to say, okay, I'll get back to you instead of, Sit down to get in that conversation, and I've had them, having been an administrator a couple of times, going, "Oh my God, what now? What that? How, how do I accomplish this?" Well, you know, hopefully that resource will help you guys out a little bit. But we have a question here. In in your dealings, what is the current cost of level two charging stations? So, level two, it, it's a little bit of an open end question here. But the level two actually can go from a range. Uh, it depends upon what your milli, uh, kilowatt hours charging, Sean. I think it is is how it's measured uh-huh. and there's a there's a low end of level two and there's a high end of level two so i'll tell you right now in my house i bought a, a charging station for my tesla which is a level two but it's at the lower end lower end which i get 50 miles for every hour i'm plugged in so it, it generally takes me an hour to get recharged every day <laughs> but i think it depends upon your needs and that the cost is depending upon if you want the low end or the high end of level two it's it's then driven by amperage after there. So there's no one easy way to answer that. It depends on what your hookup is and what your capacity of your electricity is at those sites as to what you do. And then the level three, which are the DC chargers, which charge at six, I think it's roughly 600 miles per hour they're plugged in. So they're extremely fast, you know, which is the low end, the 110 charges at five miles for every hour you're plugged in. So, the cost is driven by your technology of what you want to use. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. I, I I know the one we just did in Newton. I I can't remember the number off the top of my head. If if, if whoever that had that question, they want to know, uh, drop me an email. I can I can get them that number this afternoon. Um, but but I think it depends. It, it depends on what you want to do to that site. It's just like technology. If you want a new computer, do you just get a one that's just got the basics, or do you want to tweak it based upon speed? technology, your your chips, it's the same deal. You you need to configure what you're looking to pay for. It's Correct. all technology driven. So to answer the question for my home charger, which charges at 50 miles for every hour is plugged in, cost me $300 to buy the unit. It cost me a hundred bucks to install it, but I connect every day. All right, Sean, the next one, we got off of those. So it talks about, uh, so you, you have found grants or matching grants about the, the green procurement. 
you talk about the procurements, you actually you cite the ES, C and J, uh, which now goes out to, to March of 2023. <coughs> Anything more you want to add there, Sean? Yeah. Um, I just want to touch on source well a little bit. I want to hit up on local finance notice uh, 2012-10. Uh, and that's, that's if, we're, if you're going to get this off the nationals, and the vast majority, I'm, I'm sure, know this, and, and I don't want to belabor the uh, the process on it, um, but, but I still run into a lot of – and I'm, I'm all over the state, kind of like you are, John. And I, I still run into situations where, you know, it gets treated like a, a state uh, a state co-op or a regional pricing co-op, county co-op, that sort of thing. You know, the nationals, if, if you haven't delved into LFN 2012-10 recently, just, just take a look in there. there there's, there's an advertisement period in there. You, you know, you have to come up with a fact sheet, a cost savings. Um, you know, the advertisement has to be 10 days uh, before we get out there and, and, and the resolution of awards. So it's, it's not quite the same um, as, as the state co-op resolutions. And, and like I said, I, I don't want to – Labor something that, that's that's more you know elemental, but but I still run into it sometimes where people are just like oh, I'm going to put on a national and it's the same as a as a local or state uh, co-op and, and they're not. So just 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 be aware of that that the uh, the, the, the LFN demands certain things on the national level, uh, and I just want to touch upon that and that kind of ties in the green products with with, with our purchasing and uh, satisfies our CEO. <laughs> Great. So Sean, I think that wraps up where we were going to go. Anybody yeah, listen, I, I want to thank you. I, 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 I and I'll answer your question. I want to apologize for everybody. I hope you heard me okay. Uh, I, I, I spent about twenty-five dollars worth of gas during this during this trip, <laughs> but it's uh, it, it, it's it, it's always a pleasure. I, I haven't had the the, uh, the good fortune of speaking at this roundtable in about four years, and, and I thank you for the invite. Hey, so Sean, so everybody's for everybody's edification. So what the iPhone? Which one are you on now? iPhone seven. I'm on iPhone 8. <laughs> you son of a gun. You tell the story. Sean's funny. So, anyway, thank you, Sean. We appreciate your joining us for this call. Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, John. Right. Have a safe trip home. So, John, you want to do about a five-minute break? Let everybody regroup before we do the final session? Sounds good to me. All right. We'll see so you We meet back by yeah. 11? 11 on the dot. We'll start up again. Sounds good. All right, you got it,
Okay. John, I can see you're ready to go. Hands ready to go. <laughs> All right, bye. So I know that Betty Bauer especially has been so excited about talking about this today, and Elka has been preparing that they create their own slides. So Elka, do you want to run your own slides? Or do you want me to put them up on mine? Uh, if you want to put them up, that'd be great. Since my computer is in slow motion. Let me go find. I gotta find it. I mean, I can try it, but it's all right. I, I amended the slides a little bit, so let me just find out where I am before I do this. There it is. I have too many things open. Is showing up? Yes. All right, good. So we started off. So, Elka, you want to run? Is it or Betty? Who wants to start this thing off? Or do you want me to start it off? I, I can start it off. And if you and um, John Mooney want to, you know, cut in if there's points that Betty and I are going over that you want to elaborate on or, you know, tell us things that find it's helpful to, to others, that'd be great. Sure. So, so I, added, um, I added two slides to yours, though. Okay, so if I see a slide I don't recognize, you, you can cut in. So on the first one, I, I love the first one, though, with the, the writing on the whiteboard. The second one talks about anybody that's taken current fund one, especially with me, knows that there's five steps to closing at your year end, right? You You look at the first one is your prior year appropriation reserves. What do you need to do? The second one is closing out your current year appropriations and moving them to appropriation reserves, realizing your tax revenue, and then obviously closing out your revenues to budget operations and then operations to fund balance. Those are the five core steps, but they're not that easy, right? And then I think Elka, getting to your point that you're gonna to get to in a little bit is you know, before you close out step one, do you have any contracts, accounts payable, anything that's lingering out there that you need to take care of, you know, that you want to preserve going into the next year so it doesn't just lapse into fund balance or operations, right? Because we don't call that surplus here. Uh, the second step talks about the transfer of current year appropriations to appropriation reserves. But, you know, do you have grants that have not been charged off? Um, do you have debt service that's unexpended because it doesn't, move over, it automatically cancels by statute. So there's no provision for us to just take that money. <clears throat> for the towns, not the counties, you have the reserve fund collected taxes. Did you charge that off? Um, there is deferred charges. Did you take care of them? Because they're non-cash entries. So it's really the non-cash entries that really bind you up. Um, appropriation cancellations, have they been recorded? Did you do something to mitigate a loss of revenue or something else? Um, and then if you've got an overexpenditure, depending upon your system, do you have to manually move that over and make that a deferred charge, or is that something that's automatic in your system? So that's out of step two. Realizing your tax revenue, though, is, you know, have you applied your prepaid taxes, um, overpayments that you deal with them, senior citizens and veterans deductions? And then obviously, if you've got a tax sale, did you move those items over to your tax title liens? So there's a little bit more behind the scenes that you need to figure out before you move forward. Um, and then when you're done, you've got all those steps done, you now need to close your revenues out to operations. <coughs> so again, do you have any grants that are open, right? Because you need to realize your grant revenue and current fund, move it to grant fund, assuming that you operate a grant fund. And if you don't, you still need to manage that on your current fund balance sheet. 
And then the final one is closing your operations to fund balance unless you've got a deficit of which the deficit then goes to your deferred charge, not your, your fund balance. So that's just a little bit of an expansion on what we do when we talk about current fund. So Elka, I'm gonna move now to your timeline that I know you and Betty have worked on together. Okay, thank you, John. Um, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, Betty and I were asked to talk about tips and tricks to close the, year, the book that you're in. Um, everyone has a different process and there's no right or wrong. So today we would like to discuss what we do based on different parts of the year since many of the step, steps done throughout the year will save you time and aggravation later. Our discussion will be based on a timeline of what can be done at the beginning of the year, what can be done during the year, what can be done November, December, and then what you would start doing wrapping up in January. Okay. So at the beginning of at the beginning of the year, as you're creating your new, resolu new year's resolutions, it's also a good time of the year to set up your routines for your accounting system. Right. Going to talk a bit about Morris County. Okay. So I think it's important to make a plan to set up procedures and make sure that everyone needs to know is aware. Um, there are many steps taken um, that can be taken throughout the year to make life easier at year end. Um, we have checklists for many processes at the county. We have month end checklists, year ends. Um, checklist for step-by-step -step processes. I'm personally a big fan of them. Um, it keeps us organized and it's a way to make sure that all your bases have been covered. Um, in September, I'll create a year-end schedule. This is a timeline of the due dates for the close of the AFS, the ledgers, the ADS, and the audit schedules. Um, staff are advised of the importance of attendance during the months of December and January to enable the work to be completed on time. I think it's important to set the expectations early on. So, Betty, do you uh, allow people to take time off at the end of the year? Not here, they don't. <laughs> yeah, not in Bergen either. How about you, Alka? Nope. When right. everybody the end gets of the year. Is off. year. It's off limits. Otherwise, you've got to have something really special to get off during that time frame. No. So, so Betty, your your list, your your monthly sign off list, which become part of your year end closing, they're extensive, correct? Correct. Yeah, there's several items on there. I'll touch base on on some of them, some of the important, the major items. But yeah, I mean, the checklists are usually like four pages long. For current fund, I think it's four pages. It's a lot of different items it goes over. Right. And just for everybody's edification, that talks about, you know, are there outstanding uh, encumbrances for the prior year? Did you prove them? Are they still valid? Um, do your your ledgers, all your subsidiary ledgers tie back into the main ledger? So it's a little bit of it's just it's like tying out your AFS at the end of the year. You're just doing it on a monthly basis. Correct. Right. It forces them to dig. Yep. Yeah, I'll get more into that later on. I freeze or did everybody else freeze? Elka, do you want to do the budget transfers? Uh, yeah. So um, during the, oops, let's go back. Okay. Uh, during the first three months of the year, it's good practice to look at your appropriation reserves and find areas that you can transfer to line items that can then be canceled to reserves at the end of the year. Um, it can be difficult to fund, for, fund the storm trust, accumulated absence trust, or capital improvement fund accounts, but by making transfers into salaries, CPW, fleet, and capital improvement funds with other unspent funds, it will allow for the potential to move those amounts if revenues hold the line and you are able to replenish your fund balance. Uh, next slide. The best way to have a smooth year end close is not to wait until year end to do everything. It is important to know that what's going on in your general ledger throughout your year. Checklist is a good way to hold yourself and your team accountable. Keep up. It's easier to find a mistake or posting error within the month or quarter that it occurs. It is important to make sure the bank statements are reconciled monthly. At this time, you should also be following up on outstanding checks and stale dated checks so that you are not dealing with the mess at the end of the year. 
Mail has been notoriously slow since COVID, and many checks are getting lost in the mail. Um, taxes should be reconciled between the accounting system and the tax collection system on a monthly basis. Current year taxes receivable should equal the reserve, and the amount to be raised should be realized. Same holds true for delinquent taxes. At least quarterly, debt service paid in current should be recorded in the capital fund so that deferred charges funded equals bonds payable. Monthly, or at least quarterly, a reconciliation of trust fund cash balances to trust fund reserves ensures that everything was posted properly. If you also keep a spreadsheet of those cash accounts, it will assist in preparing the trust cash schedule for your audit and AFS. Okay. So as John mentioned, at the, uh, you can stay back to that one, yep. So as John mentioned, we have closing checklists for every fund that's part of the monthly close. Um, the checklists have many steps to prove out the ledgers, and it helps the accountants to catch mistakes and, as John said, really dig into um, certain items. Um, some of the major items include proofing the cash balances in MSI to the ledger. The control accounts on the trial balance should tie to the budget trial balance. Reconciling the inner funds and ensuring that the inner funds agree to the corresponding balance in the respective fund. Ensuring that revenues have been posted accurately and if it's a monthly revenue to make sure that we've received 12 months worth by the end of the year. Uh, reserve accounts should equal their corresponding receivable account and the open PO uh, report ties should tie to the encumbrance report and the encumbrances on the budget trial balance. As far as fixed assets, the department should be notifying us of any additions or disposals. To be thorough, we have an accountant that reviews the bill list for items over $5,000 to see if any should be recorded as a fixed asset. If an item needs to be included in the inventory, then we'll work with the department on supplying them with tags and getting it recorded in MSI, the fixed asset system. Each department has identified a fixed asset coordinator as per the county's policy. So quarterly, we run a fixed asset report by division. We email it to the division's fixed asset coordinator and ask them to review the report against the assets they have on hand and to notify us of any discrepancies. So this helps us to stay on top of it throughout the year. Then annually, I'll have an accountant that goes to each department and perform a fixed asset inventory as well. Um, updating your financials. So we prepare our own audit schedules, which I believe is important because it helps the accountants to really understand their funds and how everything flows through. We actually um, prepare our financials quarterly. So we started this when COVID hit um, with the new concept of working remotely and the uncertainty of how the year was going to proceed. I wanted to be prepared for a worst case scenario. So I had one of the accountants that has programming backgrounds work with the accountants on getting as many audit schedules as automated as possible. So she used the custom report writing feature in MSI and essentially recreated some of the audit schedules. So the accountants have to run the report, export it to Excel and massage it. Many schedules are linked. So once they populate the information in one tab, it, automatic, it automatically updates some of the other schedules. Once we had this process automated, many of the accountants expressed that they actually like doing it better this way um, because it alleviates pressure at the end of the year and it helps us to catch and correct mistakes early on. So we've been doing this now for about three years and it's been working really well. That's great. Yep. Uh, next slide. I'm just waiting for you guys to boss me around. <laughs> um, so if, if you've been keeping up with your tasks throughout the year, November and December will be much more manageable. If you haven't, it's not too late. Um, to help assist with the close, both Betty and I send year-end memos out. I send this to the departments um, so that they know the last date for payroll changes, the last date requisitions can be entered, um, the last day they can submit invoices for payments in the current year, and the date petty cash is due. I also include a due date for the list for the following year of when invoices need to be turned into AP to make the bills list. My memo also asks people to review their open purchase orders for now. 
keep everyone out of MSI after a certain date, um, which actually is today, at the end of today. Um, so it's, since it's so hard to close a moving target, we limit MSI um, use to the finance department in, from tomorrow on. Why are you close that early? So that we're not chasing around a million departments trying to um, enter requisitions. They should know what they have to do. They sh if there's an emergency purchase that needs to be done, we, we go in and put it in, in the finance department. Because they all, our approval steps, we have six people approving every purchase order, and we can't be concentrating on doing our year-end close if all these additional purchase orders are going through that we have to now what we're right. doing and approve. Well, in some of your notes here, you have, you know, did you move your capital improvement fund? Did you clear your inner funds? Did you do your tax entries, tax sale, tax liens, added and omitted? And those are all the things that are jogged by each one of these closing steps. <coughs> Is, did you look at it? Did you, did you clean it up? And I think writing your financials on a quarterly basis, you know, the joke was always that in Wharton, I had my AFS and my audit financials done by January 2nd. The way I did that is I did a soft close in November. That became my jog of everything that we had to do during the month of December to either clean it up or, or you know, to, to fix whatever happened. Um, and all I did was update for one month and my financials were done. You know, Joe Caval six funny about saying that, you know, I had two journal entries in Wharton because we're so small. We had the same number of journal entries as anybody else, but it was just that it, it was a process that was put in place years ago that we were able to have our financials done on January 2nd every year. You know, but some of the tricks are that we didn't record, <coughs> our, we recorded 12 months of interest, but we were always one month behind. So we weren't waiting for a bank statement to come in to record December interest because I had my 12 months of interest in November. And I've taken the same position in Bergen where we're doing the same, had the auditor sign off on it and it was fine. So it's just a matter of coming up with your own process to get you there. But writing the financials themselves is, I mean, we're all CFOs, it should be, you know, it's, it's, it's second hand. We know how to do this. It's just a matter of taking our ledgers and putting them into a different format. You want to move on or is this good for this slide? Uh, we have more on the slide. Okay. Betty, do you want to? Sure. <clears throat> sure. So beginning of November, I'll send an email to the staff with the year and expectations and schedule. Uh, you have to go back. Yep. So the year and expectations are my expectations as to when everything should get done to close out the year in a timely manner. And the schedule has all the AFS and audit schedules listed, the account responsible for each, and the date the schedule must be completed by. And I'll quickly run through the year end closeout expectations based upon this year. So all cash receipts, disbursement journals, and journal entries must be approved in a timely manner. They must be reviewed, posted, and coded before year end. So all inner funds must be finalized by December 21st. There must be no inner funds outstanding at year end other than between current and grant funds. Ledgers must be reviewed and closed by year end. So at year end, the accountants are doing a thorough review of their ledgers and completing the closing checklist and that must be done before they leave for the day. The chief accountant and treasurer will start closing the books on December 30th. So at the county, we have a multi-level review process. Everything that is prepared by the accountants is reviewed by at least two people, usually the chief accountant and treasurer before it comes to me for final approval or signature. And then we'll be closing MSI on January 4th. So this gives us only a few days subsequent to December 31st, to review all the ledgers and make sure that we haven't missed anything for the year, um, that all entries have been posted and posted accurately, interest postings have been completed, um, postage along with many other items. In the month of December, we prepare two pre-closes for each fund, one after each commissioner meeting. Typically, if an error occurs, it's related to the bill meeting. In an effort to avoid any last minute corrections and to ensure there are no issues going into the close, we have the accountants go through their checklist after each meeting. So that summarizes the year and expectations relative to actually closing out the year. But then there are other items completed, 
to help properly close out the year. So for example, the first week in November, one of the accounts will start reaching out to the departments about their appropriation reserve encumbrances. He'll work with the departments on whether an encumbrance should be set up in contracts payable to be paid at a future date, whether it should be left open to be paid out by year end, or if it can be canceled, which will close the operations. The goal is to have this finalized by the end of November. This gives me a better picture of the fund balance regeneration. Um, once I know how much is available that can lapse, I could better determine how much I could put into the reserve. So storm recovery, accumulated absence, uh, the mosquito reserve, and contracts payable. By mid-December, I need to see the interest calculations from all bank account and investment interests for dedicated capital, road opening, and park capital. Because again, having this information helps me with the fund balance projection. And the fund balance projection helps me determine some of the closeout transactions as far as reserves and items to cancel. Um, with the last pay in October, we'll analyze all the salary accounts to see what accounts, if any, will require a transfer. I'll take into account any retros or unsettled labor contracts. I'll also review the O&E budgets and work with the departments on any O&E transfers. We prepare year-end letters for petty cash reimbursement and return of funds by year-end. I'll have purchasing, review the online recs and MSIs that departments have entered but have not been approved so that they're not on the system when we close. Um, and the last meeting in December, I'll have the resolutions on for the commissioner meeting to cancel debt service, a resolution to cancel contracts payable if needed, and then a resolution to transfer money into the reserves. And grant balances should be reviewed for possible cancellations. If the grant period is over and funds are not spent, then the appropriated reserve and grant receivable may be able to be canceled. Also look at your unappropriated reserves to see if Chapter 159 resolutions need to be prepared before the cutoff at the LGS. The LGS has a website on, under their fiscal reports that you can see all of your grants that have been approved for your local entity. Um, improvement authorizations and capital should also be reviewed to see if any remaining balances can be canceled and put to your capital or capital improvement fund. Um, if throughout the year it has been determined that outstanding checks can be canceled, a resolution should be prepared and then those balances can be canceled. If you haven't updated the financials throughout the year, at this time of the year it is a huge help to prepare your schedules. It will allow you to make any corrections and have the, the, have the time necessary to prepare those resolutions while there are still commissioner or council meetings. All the information for the financials is found in your accounting system. Trust should also be rec reconciled and reserves should be matched with the cash balances. If you prepare your own fixed asset schedules, those should be finalized for the year, including any disposal and additions. Check to make sure the funds are transferred to capital improvement funds. Check to make sure that inner funds are cleared with the exception of your grant to from current. And if you have any inner fund receivables, remember to create the reserves. Lastly, make sure all tax entries have been recorded. That includes rec recording the tax sale, moving tax receivables to tax title liens, and recording the added and omitted. Make sure that all payments have been made to your school and, of course, your county. Hey guys, I'm just gonna jump in and do our first polling question. So the first question is, do you or your municipality feel prepared for your year end close? And I'll leave it open for a minute for everyone to get their answers in. And while the everybody's answering, one of the questions that had come up was, is this PowerPoint going to be available uh, after the class year? Yeah, I can send it in the follow-up email as long as Betty and Elka are okay with that. I'll include it um, when I send out the survey and the recording. Yeah. Great. Okay, and there are the results. Thanks, guys. So Katie, I have all of the presentations if you don't, so I can send them to you. Great, yeah, that'd be great. 
my dog is angry at somebody right now. We go to the last slide. So after the well, after the books are in order, you are in the home stretch. When I come to the office on January 2nd, I am still working in December. The only thing I have to do is record my December interest. Like John, I've never had my books closed. Um, we look to reconcile the bank recs to make sure there are no more cash entries as well. And we make sure all the ledgers tie. And once we are ready to roll the year, I contact IT to make sure we get a clean backup. Um, prior to rolling the year, we print out all of our reports for our file copy and a PDF for the auditors. Once we roll the year, we run the post-closing reports to confirm that the balances are correct and that the system closed properly. Then we know we have a good backup to restore if necessary. All right, so I also prepare an Excel closing proof for MSI for current funds, um, the Improvement Authority and the Insurance Fund. So I'll have my pre-closing trial balances and then the entries for the closeout transactions. So my lapsing reserves, the transfer of current appropriations to reserves, closing the revenues to operations, and then closing operations to fund balance, and then what my final balances should be. So when we actually close the funds in MSI, I have the spreadsheet to proof too. And once you have your financial statements in order, you are ready to prepare your AFS and your ADS. And you can roll your year, enter your pump temporary budget, and make everyone happy when they can enter requisitions again. Because okay. all of you are in the same boat that as soon as that January comes, they all are calling you as to when they can, you know, enter requisitions in the system. And I want to thank everybody for their attention and happy holiday. Yes, thank you. Any questions? I have no questions posted. I I'll do our one, dog one to weigh in, so here he is. Cute. I'll do our second poll um, if people do have questions while they're putting them in. So this one is in prior years, who has prepared your town's annual debt statement and annual financial statement? There's a couple different options there. I'll leave this open for a minute. So, you know, they say the stats for the state of New Jersey, less than 10% of CFOs prepare their own financials. So let's see what this comes back with. Mm -hmm. I know John expects much more from his clients. <laughs> it would be a great thing, but we help them out either way. I'll give it another second if anyone hasn't responded. So what's funny is I got down to Bergen last year and I'm like, okay, let's, the AFS is ready to be written. Let's, let's go. They're like, no, no, we do it. I'm like, what do you mean we do it? So each accountant has their own section that they prepare. So I was not allowed to touch it until they were all done. Wow. Driving me nuts. Driving me absolutely out of my mind because I'm like, well, wait a second. It's January 2nd. Where are you at? But it's a much bigger operation, so it takes a little bit longer. All right. It's a pretty good response. I think they're just trying to make you guys happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So are you comfortable with that scenario there, John? What's that? Uh, everybody else prepares a little piece of it and then you get to review it. Well, what's funny is I got done with the first review and I should, I sent back my comments, which anybody who's worked with Bud Jones knows what it's like to get your year in comments. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a comment for every single page and I'm like, well, but we've always done it this way. So that's great. Then you've always done it wrong. Let's fix it. Yep. And so. So we move forward with fixing the way we do our financials, but it's you know it's just a different process. Everybody's got their own way to do it. Um, you know the interesting part is for a county, and you know Elka and Betty will know this. When you go to fill out your schedules, we require the county version, which is much more expanded. <coughs> and the state did not prepare enough pages for us to do our capital or our grant inside the budget model that they sent out. So it was two weeks of sending a request. Hey, can you fix it? Can you fix it? No response. So we 
we jailbroke the, the program, cracked the password, expanded our sheets, and I got a call like two weeks later. Hey, we just got your call. What do you need to do? I said, well, we're done. <laughs> I said, we, we broke your password. We sent it back without it. And I was like, okay, thanks. Don't tell anybody else how to do this. But we do because you, you got to be able to move. Yeah. And they were just unresponsive. No. But fortunately, I, I have a, uh, a, a password cracker for any Excel sheet. I can break it open. So it's all right. We may work. Well, then we may be in touch as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I see no questions posted. I think we're rated our time allotment of 1130, 12 o'clock. There was a there was a question, but I did clear it and I was going to bring it up here. It said, uh, what did it say? Says, well, at least John is a good looking dog. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we do have one more piece to add to this. <clears throat> and I added Chuck Kucha to our speaker list today to talk about new legislation that's going to impact uh, tax and finance. <laughs> Chuck, you there? I am here. Excellent. Hold on. Nice to know. Can you you can hear me and you can see me? We can I we can't can we see you, Chuck? I can't see you, but I can hear you. So I asked Chuck okay. to join because Chuck and I are also we, we both serve on the League Legislative Committee for uh tax and finance. It talks about some legislation that's coming through. And there's been a couple of bills that we thought that might be worth talking about today. <coughs> You know, they've got some goofy stuff out here. One is a sponsor by Flynn and Scarfenberger. Um, it's Assembly Bill 4588, provides for gross income tax credit for donations made to eligible schools for funding student meals. Nice idea, but just something else for us to deal with, not at the local level. <coughs> but it's also, you know, you want to purchase playground equipment, you donate money, your donations capped, it's $500. Nice feel good stuff. There's also one that was put on by sponsors are Moriarty, Danielson, Stanfield, and Buco. Um, talks about the eligibility for senior freeze reimbursement if you have a bump year where you've, your income exceeds that amount of money. Um, again, it's just a bill, it's not a law yet. Uh, the other one that they put in here, and this is the one why I asked Chuck to, to weigh in, is Assembly Bill 4734, which is sponsored by Barranco out of District 26, <coughs> excludes contributions to municipal first aid or rescue squads from appropriations cap uh, for certain local units. You know, we've been seeing a bunch of bills go out that are tied to cap relief. Um, you know, I know that Sarlo, Senator Sarlo from Bergen is involved with one right now, which focuses on the appropriation cap, not the levy cap. And I think that, you know, as we're putting our budget together, we realize the levy cap is really where we need the relief, not the appropriation side. Um, so I know Chuck and I have been working closely together for probably what, six months now, Chuck, if not longer? If not longer. Uh, so on the changing the new cap rules to eliminate all former caps, start with a brand new cap base, um, preserving any cap bank that you may have had, but tying it to a CPI that is more reflective of what's going on with the economy. So, so the bill that John is talking about is S2619. And basically what it does is it gives you a three-year exemption for insurance, health, liability, and cyber, fuel, and solid waste. But there's no corresponding amendment which allows for the same three-year exemption in the levy cap. Uh, at this point in time, after talking to the legislature, they feel that the levy cap bank that exists in most municipalities will be enough to cover the increases in those items. Uh, we know this is not a universal situation and all municipalities do not have sufficient levy cap bank to cover these kinds of increases. So what John and I have been working on is following through with what both uh, appropriation cap review committees did probably 10, 10 years ago. Which, it, which was to come to the conclusion that the appropriations cap doesn't really work. Um, so we've been working on a levy cap amendment, which is based in this, the consumer price index. Uh, and that way, 
we become more flexible. The rating agencies like the flexibility that we have with regard to the, um, uh, the budget and it allows us to have a cap that's related to what's actually going on in the market. And I think, Chuck, it's, I think it's important to note that we identified that the state has already acknowledged for LOSAP purposes that there's a CPI index that measures, I think it's Philadelphia and Camden is the one that they've identified as their, their tracker that, you know, that's how we're allowed to grow our LOSAP contributions. So if they've already identified one that they feel is appropriate statewide for LOSAP, why not apply that same index for our other cap issues? And, and of course, the problem with that one is that it doesn't take into account the northern New Jersey, New York CPI, which is always going to be higher than that. But it gives us something greater than 2%. It does. It, it certainly does. And the other part of that argument is, do we create a floor? So are you always following the CPI or are you following CPI no less than here's your floor? I think, I think the only way to, to, to get that to work with the assembly is to follow the CPI because in the years where they're low, we should be cognizant of the fact that we're not raising uh, taxes in, in years where that happens. Where they're higher and costs go up, then we need to be flexible and to meet the uh, requirements of service in the municipality. You know, our only, the, but our handcuffs are is we sell contracts that are beyond one or two years so that we might be obligated to pay those amounts into those future years where we've already obligated ourselves, which may be beyond the CPI. It may be, John, but rem remember when we did the when we did the calculation, when we did the sample calculation, we weren't very far off of what the levy cap calculation is now. We could still see that there would be some banking if you were reasonable, yes. uh, which, which would help you as you go forward on those long-term contracts. Right, and under any of these caps, I mean, our responsibility is to manage our caps, our banks, so that we can react in the future years to something that might be unknown. So I, I think it plays, it's hand in hand with how we, we manage no matter what we have. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We're, we're still talking to the assembly uh, to see if we can get them to address uh, some change in the levy cap. Um, it's, it's not over. It hasn't, that bill hasn't advanced to the point where they're voting on it. Right, and we're working on both the Senate side and the Assembly side on seeing if we can get somebody to sponsor this in the bite. But, you know, there's been a reluctance. Anything to deal with taxes, nobody wants to touch because the election year is what, next year? Next year. So they don't want to increase your taxes any more than they have to. But they also understand that we're at a point here where we can't afford things. You know, there, there's some new legislation that was put forward to increase the pay to pay limits, the bid thresholds, you know, move counties to 150,000, towns to I think 75,000. I forget what the, the numbers are off the top of my head. But I think they understand that those static thresholds are old now. I mean, we've been dealing with pay to play at 17.5 for how many years, which is the original bid threshold. Or pay to play in my mind should mirror what the bid threshold is. Yes, because obviously, you know, we we run through 17.5 in about a minute and a half nowadays with practically nothing. Right. Is so I, I Chuck, I think uh, the other bills that I had posted here were were nothing. I mean, the other one that was up here was uh assembly bill. 4797 and Senate Bill 3255, which allows us to recycle more of the reclaimed asphalt, which the DEP had actually, I don't know if you know, your, your roads used to last 30 years. Now you're lucky if they last 10 to 15 years. And a lot of it has to do with the quality of the oil that they put back into the, the product. That, that's my phone. Hold on one second. That's everything. John, when you asked when you asked me to jump in here, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> so, but I, I, you know that one's another one sponsored by. We've got a local uh, senator we are, are all familiar with, which is Senator Orohos on that one. But allows us to recycle more of the good material that's stuck together, rather than this new stuff that they're trying to be eco friendly that falls apart in fifteen years rather than last for thirty years. You know, but with that that feeling good about yourself and green comes the the cost to replenish more frequently because it doesn't last. 
Well, that, that's true. And we really haven't had the longevity of dealing with all of this green and environmental infrastructure to know how long those things last and what is the actual uh, replacement time and, and all the rest of that. I mean, you were talking about cars before and uh, you know, the, the stats are the stats, but what they don't account for is the, uh, the ability for municipal employees to, uh, to use vehicles in ways that nobody else understood or nobody else planned, and then we don't have them for service for as long as a period of time. Right. There is, there is one that, that, that I, I noticed the other day that was particularly concerning to me. It's not in finance, but it has a big impact to us. It's A2886, it's the PTSD um, legislation that's being presented. And the problem that I have with it, and everybody's for making sure that all of our employees that develop PTSD are, are taken care of. Uh, but what, what this bill does is it takes the decision process away from the municipality in determining whether or not uh, an employee with PTSD should continue to work or not. It brings it to the superior court, wow. uh, which provides for attorneys to be involved and all the rest of it. It doesn't give us any consideration with regard to the towns that have civil service and all the process there, the towns that, that are police accredited, uh, where we uh, go through a process to determine whether or not it's how we're going to handle it in workers' comp in relation to the disability pensions. Um, it's just another bill being processed that takes decision, the decision-making ability away from local government, which is where it really needs to be. Right, and you're putting over the course, which, you know, which way they lean is gonna control the decision-making. So it, right. you're right, it's another one that we're tasked with paying for with somebody else making those decisions, right. whether it's the legislature or the judiciary system. Yeah, that, that's one we, we need to keep an eye on. You know, one of, Chuck, one of the things that I think you were on this call is with Lori Bucklew with the league is going back to when they implemented the 2% levy cap rules, you know, which originally, if, if everybody remembers, was supposed to be a 0% if Steve Sweeney had had his way. It was Chris Christie that argued for the 2% to give you some escalator, not being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, but what bills has the legislature passed from that point forward that has tasked local government with paying for items that are not... A, an exemption for the two percent levy cap. You know, whether we've got the the presumption of uh, cancer presumption for firefighters, we've got the. I mean, there's all these new items that have been put on that we've been now tasked to finance that are above and beyond this two percent. And yeah. how to deal with it? I think there needs to be a living document to document what they've tasked us with versus what the handcuffs they put on us. Absolutely. And, and John, the, the largest one that, that impacts on, on that is just the change from how we handle uh, disability pension and workers' comp. It used to be that workers' comp would get the credit from the pension system if you went to disability. Now it's completely reversed. Disability gets the credit from the workers' comp, which makes the workers' comp piece much more expensive. Right. So again, another push down on local government to, to fund inside of our 2% caps. And those, those are not exceptions to those caps. Right, exactly. And the, the legislation that Chuck and I've been working on is taking a lot of these items where we've where we've been seeing the pressure, moving them outside the, the cap calculation to be a direct charge for an adjustment, mm -hmm. like insurance, cyber, all the things that are now the new buzzwords and pulling them out, allowing you to, to adjust appropriately for your cost with the clawback in future years that if you don't spend it, it comes back. So it becomes part of our planning. Um, but we, we did heap on a lot of stuff to see what we can get with the understanding that we would claw back some of those or pull back some of those asks, knowing that they wouldn't be honored. Right, right. That, that, that's accurate, John. Um, there's been, we have some, uh, senators and assemblymen who are interested in uh, presenting a, a completely revised cap uh, amendment, uh, but we haven't gotten to that point yet because we don't have enough of the uh, partners and uh, shareholders involved in, in agreeing to what the me best method is, but we're working on it. 
so and so everybody knows when when Chuck and I've had these meetings, we've had it with the league, we've had it with NJAC, we've wrapped in what three different auditing firms in the Northeast to right. get their way in to 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 figure out what would be reasonable. So we we've got a lot of partners in this in this effort to move forward and looking for you know what what is glaringly wrong. And I, I don't think we found anything wrong. We found everything that's right in trying to make this move. It's just the appetite for the elected to move this forward. Correct, and we and we've also included the uh, and we had conversations with the rating agencies too, which is very important because we don't want to affect the good ratings that we've developed over the years, even though they look at New Jersey as the oddball out because we do things differently than the rest of the United States. Well, actually, Chuck, that's a great point because the two percent cap is a negative from a rating agency standpoint. They would like to see us have more flexibility and the ability to pay for what we do, and we know that you know debt service is unlimited ad valorem taxation goes to to pledge towards that uh, which is their focus but there's also other things that they want to see addressed <coughs> the ability to afford your pension bill i think we're by default we're rated at a b plus because we follow new jersey's rating because we're stuck with new jersey so there's a lot of different things out there but you know that that's another one if we can get this thing through that will help us with our ratings yes without a doubt So, John, anything else for us? I think we we blew through our legislation, everything else. I think we're bumping up against our last 15 minutes. I don't see any questions posted. Nothing. I got nothing posted. And I, I just think everything was informative today. I like the legislative up, update aspect of this, too. Uh, I think it brings that uh, an extra level into this that we've never really had in the past. So uh, I'd like to continue doing that. I want to see what the reaction is from um the attendees on their sheets today if they like that or not so if you can give that a thumbs up katie just uh dropped her microphone so i guess she's going to ask one last question yeah and i just well, i just wanted to add like you said john um the exit survey will pop up when we close the webinar just make sure you complete that like john said leave any comments if you enjoyed kind of the last piece of that today um, and then also future discussion topics, and that'll be the survey for credit. And we'll also send that out in the follow-up email with the presentations um, that I'll get from John. So thank you guys. That's great. Nice. So Chuck and I serve on the League Legislative Committee again for tax and finance, but we have access to every one of the bills that's being discussed. So I, I think, <laughs> John, your point that we can add this to every session to talk about what you know what's in the hopper, what are we looking at, so we can respond you know, we can put resolutions of support from our towns for them or against them. You know, I, I think that the cap issues are the real one right now. I know in talking to Betty ahead of the session that I know she was up against some cap issues that were not right. real fun. And she's trying to figure out how to maneuver that. But this would be a way to share different ideas on on how to maneuver around them, how to, to deal with it. Um, you know, for municipalities deal with the, the two caps, the appropriation levy cap. Counties deal with two levy caps, and you have to balance between the older one and the new one. And if you switch your caps of what you're following, you lose all your banking from the old one. Now, that was not statutorily established. That was established by a Mark Pfeiffer interpretation of the statute. So, I, I, you know, either we've got to remove Mark Pfeiffer's input on those things or redo the, the caps so that they are more fluid in, in working with us. But you know, we, we find ourselves at least at the county level manipulating our caps so that we can survive inside and retain our bank rather than switching back and forth. I will uh, throw out one more thing just to end on a happy note. Um, one of the things that really scare me and it has nothing to do necessarily with the, the government side, but on the school district side, you know, we do both sides of the practice, right? We do schools, we do municipalities. Right now, there's a bill that's pushing back the uh, the school deadline date. Uh, they're looking to move it. It used to be November 5th. Now it's December 5th. Now they're looking to move it back to February 5th. If, if they push back that deadline, I don't know what kind of impact it's going to have for all the uh, deadlines for my municipalities, right? Because now if auditors are doing the work into the following year, uh, to get audits out the door for schools on November or on February 5th, they're not going to be working on AFSs in that time. You know, they're not going to start their next season until that's over. I could tell you because this is where you, you logged into Nisavachi today. From my perspective, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my other partners. 
but there's no reason why the school district audit shouldn't be done in a timely manner. We do 88 of them, and we're going to have roughly 75 to 78 out the door by December 31st. So there's no reason whatsoever why this date needs to be pushed back. And, you know, we are not a part of that. But it is something to think about. You know, if this pushes back that deadline, maybe the other ones will be pushed back permanently, too. You know, it's funny, John, is we also have an SEC requirement to post our financials within a certain period of time. So yes. everybody's button heads on this issue. Yep. So stay tuned because that could be a, a pretty significant fight coming up. So we'll see. Nothing like lowering the bar, right? Yeah, I, I tell you. Everybody gets a trophy. You know, if you if you can't keep up, just get out of the way. Let the rest of us, you know, keep going. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'd like to thank everybody that spoke today. You know, we, we've got uh, Betty, Alka, we had Fred, uh, Sean on his drive. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to thank everybody for speaking today. Yes. Yeah. And thank you all for attending today. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, please fill out the surveys. Uh, it, it, it gives us some direction as we plan the future sessions. So if there's topics you wish to discuss, uh, let us know. And uh, just wishing you all on behalf of everybody here, Great holiday season and uh, looking forward to meeting up with all our clients in a very soon uh, manner, you know, after the first of the year. I hope to see you all. So, John, anything else? Not unless you're throwing a party for everybody to go to. Uh, I can't. I have another party to go to today. So, <laughs> but thank all you, right. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Take care now. All right. Bye.